This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes building a beautiful website easy, even if you're not a true alpha. I never thought that I would be making this video. The last time I made a long breakdown of a TV show, I got a lot of requests on what to cover next. The most popular suggestions were other teen shows like Pretty Little Liars or The Secret Life of the American Teenager or other Degrassi adjacent shows like Instant Star or The LA Complex. And at the time, I really did try to get into other shows that I could review. I watched the beginning of Secret Life, the beginning of One Tree Hill, even the beginning of Dawson's Creek, and in every case, I just lost steam after the first few episodes. It might come as a surprise, what with my Degrassi obsession and now Teen Wolf obsession, but I'm actually not much of a TV person. I don't watch a lot of TV in my free time. Starting a show feels like a big commitment to me most of the time, so I'm more of a YouTube video and movie watcher. But a couple months ago, a brand new Teen Wolf movie dropped on Paramount+. Plus. It was the first continuation of the show since it ended in 2017, and so far, the main response from fans seems to be overwhelmingly negative. I probably wouldn't have even known this movie existed had it not been for all the outrage I was seeing online. And for some reason, instead of going, huh, too bad, and never thinking about the show again, I decided that now would be a great time to do a full watch through of Teen Wolf. It's funny, I announced this on Twitter and someone was immediately like, can't wait for the Teen Wolf video. And at the time I was like, come on, <laughs> not everything I watch is for a video. You know, sometimes I watch things just for me. But then like halfway through season one, it was abundantly clear to me that I would in fact be making a Teen Wolf video. If you don't know, Teen Wolf is a teen horror drama that ran on MTV from 2011 to 2017, loosely based on the 1985 Michael J. Fox comedy film of the same name. Keyword being loosely. More on that in a later video. The show was created by Jeff Davis of Criminal Minds fame and executive produced by Russell Mulcahy, no relation. I was very excited to see that he was attached to this show, not because I've seen much of his work, but because he's like the only Mulcahy in Hollywood. He also directed a lot of episodes and the Paramount Plus movie. I did watch this show a little as a teen. In fact, I remember starting it several times, but like what often happens to me now, after a couple of seasons, I would just kind of lose steam. I thought I had seen the first two seasons and part of the third, but on my rewatch, I realized I definitely never actually watched season three. I believe everything I knew about season three, I learned via osmosis by being on Tumblr in the 2010s. And that is a very relevant detail in recounting my relationship to this show. I was quite the fandom Tumblrina back in the day, and so although I never got super into Teen Wolf, I did see a lot of content and a lot of fandom activity related to it. This show was a big deal on Tumblr. It was huge. I won't get into it here, but in particular, one of the ships that came out of this show consistently ranked in probably the top three popular Tumblr pairings for like years and of course shot up again following the release of the recent movie. So even when I wasn't actively watching Teen Wolf, I was usually aware of Teen Wolf. And in re-watching it, something happened. Not only has Teen Wolf awakened in me an obsession with the show itself, but it's also led to a genuine academic curiosity about werewolf cinema in general. It comes up several times throughout this video, but during this rewatch, I was supposed to be working on my film thesis paper, you know, to graduate, and I kept getting sidetracked by my voracious appetite for any scholarly writing I could find on werewolves. Werewolf stuff, and Teen Wolf in particular, has consumed my life. It's all I can think about. I love a good deep dive, and it turns out that this franchise has a lot of twists and turns for me to explore. A lot of nice werewolf caves for werewolf spelunking. This isn't exactly going to be a serious review. I have this disease where the things I watch and enjoy, I often enjoy for the wrong reasons. 
I end up ignoring a lot of the serious ways I'm supposed to engage with the thing and instead become interested in a lot of the stuff that doesn't matter. So with that in mind, I intend to break down this show not so much for the purpose of meaningful, informative recapping, or really even the purpose of giving you a straightforward assessment of its quality, but more for the purpose of what I would call extracting the camp. I'm going to take a syringe and painstakingly siphon out all of the things on this show that I found entertaining, and then inject it all directly into your bloodstream, whether you like it or not. And I'm sure this will all take me a very normal, not ridiculous amount of time to do. So even if you haven't seen the show, hopefully this will still be a fun experience for you. But because there's a lot of this show to cover, and I'm a little long-winded as a person, I plan to split this up into, at minimum, three videos. Part one, which you're watching right now, will cover seasons one through three. Part two will be a sort of intermission where we talk about some of the source material of Teen Wolf. And then part three will cover seasons four through six, and presumably the recent film. You can count on several hours worth of Teen Wolf nonsense from me in the next few months. So look forward to that. I also just want to mention that I'm aware that I'm very late to this party, and thus I'm not the first YouTuber to talk about Teen Wolf. I know Julia Cudney was really into this show as a teen and has made some great content about it. Ryan Kearns also has a long video about Teen Wolf that looks to be really great. To be honest with you, as of right now, I've only watched the first 10 minutes or so of Ryan's video, not because it wasn't good, but actually because it was so good that I started feeling insecure and worrying that if I kept watching it, I would like accidentally plagiarize it. So take that as an incredible endorsement. He's an up and coming channel and he deserves the views. But right now I'm going to take my crack at it. Cozy up in your coyote dens, crack open a brand approved package of Reese's peanut butter cups or icebreakers mints, and take a mental vacation with me to the creepy abandoned ruins that constitute this show's setting. Teen Wolf takes place in the small California town of Beacon Hills and follows Scott McCall, an aggressively average teenager, not particularly strong in academics or sports, whose life changes permanently one night when he's bitten by a werewolf and starts to transform himself. Season one is mainly a whodunit, in which a series of murders and attacks have been taking place around town. At first, they're presumed to be the work of a wild animal, but Scott and his friends soon realize that this is in fact the work of an alpha werewolf, and they need to uncover who that is. On top of that, Scott is also generally learning the ropes of being a werewolf and is trying to juggle these newfound abilities with his school and social life. Our main characters are Scott, his mainly comic relief best friend Styles Stalinsky, New Girl and Scott's love interest Allison Argent, asshole jock Jackson Whitmore, Queen Bee Lydia Martin, and who could forget, bad boy werewolf and resident town weirdo Derek Hale. On the periphery, we have Scott's mom, a nurse, Styles' dad, the town sheriff, Allison's dad, Chris Argent, patriarch of the town werewolf hunting family, an unfortunate coincidence, I know. Allison's aunt, Kate Argent, a sadistic werewolf hunter responsible for murdering Derek's family six years ago. Alan Deaton, town veterinarian who happens to also know how to treat werewolves. Derek's traumatized burn victim uncle, Peter. And token gay character, Danny. I have officially finished season one. Where to begin? I don't think it's a bad show, per se, but I also don't think it's a good show, per se. First and foremost, something that's clear to me now in a way that it never was when I watched this show as a teen is just how blatantly Teen Wolf is a Twilight ripoff. I know, it should have been obvious, but I think whenever I was watching it, maybe 2014 or 2015, was like well after the initial popularity of Twilight and well before the Twilight Renaissance, meaning I really just didn't have Twilight on the brain most of the time, so I didn't even think to compare the two. But yeah, on the rewatch, it's very clear that some guy at MTV was just like, what supernatural teen properties do we own? And some other guy was like, I think we might be able able to get the Michael J. Fox Teen Wolf movie if we wanted, and the first some guy was like, 
I guess, because the Michael J. Fox movie, to my knowledge, is like pretty straightforward comedy. And I had read the production section of this show on Wikipedia, and it had said that they had wanted to focus more on like the horror and the romance elements. And I was like, oh yeah, this is absolutely just Werewolf Twilight. However, genre-wise, two major things stick out to me as somewhat unique to Teen Wolf, at least at the time. The first is that we have a male protagonist, with the rare exception of, like, the guy from Beastly. Most Twilight ripoffs seem to follow the Bella Swan formula. We have Elena from The Vampire Diaries, Lucinda from Fallen, Nora from Hush Hush, whereas in Teen Wolf, we have Scott. He's just a guy, a regular teenage dude. And the second thing that sticks out to me is the humor of Teen Wolf. I feel like a lot, if not most, of these supernatural teen films and shows from the time were very straight dramas, whereas Teen Wolf seems to lean into the comedy a little more. Where are you getting your juice? My mom does all the grocery shopping. This might be the result of the source material being a comedy, and honestly, I think it works really well for this sort of thing. If anything, it's looking like the later seasons might take themselves more seriously, which I'm not really looking forward to. Supernatural teen romance is a pretty inherently silly idea, so to have one of these shows not take itself completely seriously all the time is refreshing, to say the least. And no one cares that you're captain of the lacrosse team! Excuse me. Co-captain. But I also have to say, another thing I don't remember thinking when I was a teen that I can't stop thinking about now is how much I hate Scott McCall. I'm sorry if he's your favorite character or something, but oh boy, I was having trouble with him. It's partly a case of boring protagonist interesting side character disease that a lot of shows have, like Scott as a person just doesn't have that many interesting personality traits. He's a pretty nice guy who wants to do the right thing most of the time. Riveting. But it's not just that. I'm so sorry, but on the rewatch, this actor is really not working for me. I know Tyler Posey has been in some other stuff, and maybe he'll improve as the show goes on, but as of right now, I am not feeling him. I don't mean any offense in saying this, but he tends to come off kind of stupid. It's probably also the writing. In fairness, they write Scott really stupid, and I'll get to that in a second. But Posey himself is just not giving the character much depth at all. I kept laughing whenever Scott was supposed to be angry because he always makes the same really over-the-top angry face. He's an eyebrow actor, and not a good one. What? It's weird, because in a lot of cases, I love dumb guy characters. I love a himbo. And it's not like it's exactly unrealistic for a teenage boy character to not be super bright or not always make the best decisions. But I think the difference is that Scott's stupid decisions are usually entirely his own fault, and they keep actively causing problems for everyone else. In keeping with this, while watching, I compiled a list of reasons Scott sucks. Here it is. Number one, he is often shirking responsibilities in favor of very selfish, short-sighted plans. Most examples of this in season one involve him leaving important situations to hang out with his girlfriend. Are my upstairs neighbors, like, wrestling up there? Because that's what it sounds like. In one episode, he skips school to hang out with Allison all day and thus misses his parent-teacher conference, which he was required to attend because he's failing a bunch of his classes. I have to go to a parent-teacher conference tomorrow because I'm failing chemistry. And when he finally does get back to school, suddenly a wild animal attacks, and in the process, Sheriff Stalinsky, Stiles' dad, almost gets hurt. He gets hit by a car. And Scott is like, I'm so guilty. I should have been there to do something. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you should have. Later, Stiles is angry at him for this, and Scott kind of doesn't get it, but it's hard to feel sympathy for him. But that isn't that bad. You know, it's not a cardinal sin for teens to goof off and miss school commitments, and it's not like we know Scott could have done much to stop a mountain lion, although he does have werewolf powers. But then there's this other episode where Kate has shot Derek with a wolfsbane laced bullet, one of the only things toxic to werewolves, and he's gonna die if Scott doesn't find the bullets she used and bring one to him. Because I'm gonna die without it. 
So he goes to Allison's house and manages to stay for dinner to meet the family in the hopes of snooping around and finding the bullets. And when I tell you, he wastes so much time. At one point, he leaves the table to take a call from Styles, and he comes back in and he's like, I should really get going. And Kate is like, no, stay. I want to get to know you better. And instead of doing the really easy, obvious thing and just making up an excuse and leaving, he stays. I want to know more about you. Sit down. Okay. <laughs> And meanwhile, we keep cutting back to Derek, who is like feverishly bleeding out onto Styles' Jeep, vomiting black blood onto the floor of the vet clinic. At one point, Derek is like, Styles, you're gonna have to cut my arm off with this bone saw. It's the only way to save me. God. And Styles is about to do it until Scott walks in at the last possible second. Like you couldn't have moved a little bit faster, Scott. Number two, bad friend. In addition to generally not seeming to care much about Styles' life or desires or needs, there's this moment when after Allison dumps Scott briefly, she like doesn't trust him because she can tell he's lying to her about all the stuff happening in town. Styles asks him to ask Lydia if she likes him because he has this huge crush on Lydia. It's kind of childish, but whatever. They're teenage besties. This is what teenage besties do. So Scott goes up to her, gets her alone, and instead of even trying to ask Styles' question, Question, immediately just asks if Allison still likes him. Do you know if Allison still likes me? And then Lydia makes out with him and Scott makes no attempt to stop her. And then Scott lies about it to Styles. So great job, Scott. Number three, bad boyfriend. When Scott and Allison break up, at one point they're in class together and Scott is like, Allison, can I send you some stuff on my phone? I think you'll like it. And Allison is like, okay, whatever. Scott proceeds to send her a bunch of romantic pictures of the two of them. God knows who took these pictures. And understandably, she gets really upset. Are you trying to make me feel even worse for breaking up with you? She's like, why would you do this? I'm trying to get over you and not feel guilty about it. Scott, of course, is just like, I don't know. I thought you would like it. Like the oaf he is. I thought you would like them. I thought they would remind you of us. Number four. This is a big one for me. More than one time in season one, Scott is snooping around through the Argent family's stuff finds something with writing in a different language, usually French, and whips out his phone. Now in these scenes, I was expecting Scott to do the logical thing and take a picture to look at later. Keep in mind, these are time-sensitive situations. He could get discovered at any second. But no, instead of taking a picture, he uses his phone to pull up like Google Translate, slowly find the detect language setting, and painstakingly type out the entire inscription. With his 2011 phone, it wasn't easy to type on those things. He's just so dumb. He's so dumb. Number five, in the season finale, Peter has like kidnapped Styles and is forcing him to log into one of Scott's accounts. I think he needs to track his phone. First of all, this scene is also really funny for the clunky product placement. We get a spot for MiFi, Apple, and AT&T, all in the space of like 30 seconds. Good luck getting a signal down here. Oh, MiFi. And you're a Mac guy. A truly incredible advertising triple whammy. But Styles types in Scott's username and password, and it turns out that not only is Scott's username Allison. His username is Allison. But his password is also Allison. His password is also Allison. I hate him. Out of all the boys in Beacon Hills, why did our protagonist have to be the mild block of cheese that is Scott McCall? But back to business, Scott rant over. The elephant in the room is that the obvious breakout star of this show is Dylan O'Brien. Styles is by far the most entertaining character and O'Brien is probably giving the best performance. And it's made even more blatant by the fact that Scott is so bland and bad at emoting. I ended up watching a few of these episodes with my mom because she had stayed up late one night to redo some knitting. And even she at one point was like, I like Styles. he's fun. He's just so dynamic 
dynamic and quick and charismatic. I don't think the dialogue on this show is always that great, but Dylan O'Brien really makes a lot of it work just with his delivery. But in addition to Dylan O'Brien, I want to give some other actors their flowers too. I was actually really appreciating Lyndon Ashby as Styles' dad. He has such great, stern, but gentle dad energy. Just born to play dads. Crystal Reed is pretty good as Allison, which again is made more plain by Scott's middling performance. Even Colton Haynes was giving me a lot more depth as the rich asshole jock character than Scott McCall, our protagonist, which is a bad sign. And finally, I'm not proud of this, I feel like it might be a controversial opinion, but I think my favorite part of the show so far is Derek. <laughs> Hear me out. It's not because he's the best character or the best actor, although I think he's fine in both respects. No, it's because I find him funny for all the wrong reasons. You guys should know at this point that I have an affinity for certain cringe fail TV show boys. I'm obsessed with the drama of Derek. Derek is like this show's werewolf equivalent of Dracula. He did, I hope he left my inhaler. Those things are like 80 bucks. When he shows up, he's lurking in the background, wearing all black, set up in the widest stance you've ever seen in your life. He never smiles, he's morally ambiguous, he has a moody, tragic backstory. His family? They all burned to death in a fire like 10 years ago. He lives and spends all of his time in basically the werewolf equivalent of a haunted house. It's technically his childhood home that was burnt up in a fire, but it's giving Haunted Mansion. Throughout the season, he keeps getting wrongly accused of, like, werewolf crimes, and watching it, you can't help but be like, gee, Derek, maybe people wouldn't suspect you of being an evil werewolf if you didn't live in the spooky, dilapidated old werewolf mansion on the edge of town. He's just great. It feels like every time he enters, there should be, like, fake fog and bats flying out of his clothes. He seems like the kind of guy who probably sleeps in a coffin and writes sad poetry. There are also a couple of really funny details I noticed relating to Derek in season one. In one episode, he's been arrested because he's been wrongly accused of murder, and the sheriff mentions to Stiles that every time they try to take a mugshot of Derek, his eyes, like, completely blow out the light in the shot. Hmm, that seems a little suspicious. Then, even funnier, in the second to last episode, we see Allison using his wanted poster for target practice, and on the wanted poster is a police sketch? Of Derek? As far as I know, a police sketch is like what you use when the person's identity or appearance is unknown. Derek is just a guy that lives in town. You know who he is. You can just find a picture of him. You explicitly said that you took mug shots. Even if the front-facing ones are ruined, you have the side profiles. It's implied that he went to school in Beacon Hills like a couple years ago. Just use his yearbook photo. This is the best you could do? I also love how they chose to situate Derek in this world. I feel like typically on a TV show with a character like this, who's kind of the slightly older outsider, but also kind of the werewolf elder to Scott, I feel like they would set him up as maybe a teacher or TA, someone one of the characters works with, someone's cousin, someone's mom's new boyfriend. I don't know. But in Teen Wolf, they didn't even try anything like that. He's just some guy. He's just some weird guy who lives in the spooky old werewolf house in the woods. According to Styles, he's only a few years older than them. That was Derek Hale. You remember, right? He's only like a few years older than us. It's not exactly bad. I just think it's kind of unusual. It's another element of Derek's character that tickled me. Like I said, I don't think that this show at this point is necessarily good, but there are some good things about it. I really liked that with most of the main teenage characters, we get at least some level of depth to them. Even a comic relief character like Styles has this implied sad backstory where his mom died somewhat recently. Even the jock bully character Jackson is revealed to have all this insecurity relating to being adopted. 
even a mean girl character like Lydia has all of this secret depth. She's hiding the fact that she's actually the smartest character by far. A lot of teen shows actually don't bother doing that. And it's particularly nice to see in a genre show like this that kind of by definition isn't required to deal with as much of that stuff if it doesn't want to. I like the simple whodunit premise. The show definitely has some campy appeal. Some of the characters are pretty fun and the pacing is pretty good. I found it really easy to binge the whole season. Seasons one and two actually only have 12 episodes, something I think I'm going to miss once we get up to those later seasons. I can definitely see the potential for this show to get better. It's just largely bogged down by its lame protagonist. <laughs> Sorry. This review is hopefully the first of six parts. Wish me luck. I'm gonna need it. I'm back. Now that I'm really getting into it, I'm realizing it might be funnier to less give you the general overview of my thoughts and more just describe what happens in the season with my commentary, because we have a lot more going on in this one already. Season two of Teen Wolf continues the saga of the world's least interesting werewolf, Scott McCall, as he keeps working on honing the wolf stuff and maintains a secret relationship with his girlfriend, Allison. Meanwhile, our sad boy King Derek, having ostensibly killed his crazy uncle Peter at the end of season one and thus assumed alpha status, is determined to turn some people into werewolves to create a pack for himself. How did you do that? I'm the alpha. He said, if no one wants to be my friend, I'll force a bunch of depressed teens to be in my friend group. You can't just go around turning people into werewolves. I can if they're willing. This introduces three new characters. Isaac Leahy, a boy being abused by his father, Erica Reyes, a shy, epileptic social outcast, and Vernon Boyd, a guy we never really learn anything about. I'm just gonna say it now. So far, this show is not very good at having black people in it. Anyway, these three characters all get bitten by Derek, have their werewolf glow up, and join his pack. He's kind of in his villain era in this season. It's not quite as fun to me as when he was a mean but generally harmless loser. And then there's Jackson. Now, Jackson was also bitten by Derek at the end of season one. He found out about Scott being a werewolf and decided he wanted to be one too, seemingly exclusively so that he could get better at playing lacrosse. Where are you getting your juice. You know, teenagers, their goals can be kind of short-sighted, but something is wrong. He doesn't seem to be turning into a regular werewolf, and eventually it's revealed that instead of becoming a werewolf, he has become something called a canima, which is like a were-lizard? You've always been kind of a snake. People in the show only ever compare him to a snake, but like, come on, he's got legs and a tail, he's a lizard. In the first half of season two, people are being attacked again, and the characters realize it's a canima, and it becomes a brief whodunit. At first they're pretty sure it's Lydia, but it turns out to be Jackson. And I feel like they never adequately explain why this happened to him. Jackson was adopted, so they basically imply that it must be something in his past or like it's about who you are or something, but I don't know. I wanted a straightforward explanation. In fact, I kept hoping that it would be something really silly and comic booky, like Derek bit him and then on the way home, he also got bit by a snake or something. Like at least that would be simple and I could laugh at it. But yes, he's a canima. And according to the legend, the canima seeks a master. It means master. The canima seeks a master. So once we're done with the first whodunit, a second whodunit begins as the characters try to figure out who's controlling the canima to do their evil bidding. It turns out to have been this guy, Matt, another character introduced in this season. Matt is a photographer and my roommates and I disliked him immediately. I feel like I just hate most teen photographers in teen media, except for you, Craig Manning. Love you. I spent the first couple episodes trying to figure out where I'd seen Matt's actor before, and it turns out he was one of the love interests in the live-action Bratz movie. So 
That's embarrassing for me. But Matt spends a lot of the show trying to pursue Allison, who is starting to have some doubts about her and Scott's relationship, because why wouldn't she? Scott sucks. And we eventually find out that Matt's been taking creepy pictures of her, including from outside her bedroom window. So yes, it made sense that he turned out to be the villain. He has this tragic backstory where, as a child, he was over at Isaac's house while the whole high school swim team, including their coach, who is Isaac's dad, like got drunk and started roughhousing in the pool and threw Matt in. Matt couldn't swim, he drowned, he was technically dead, but Isaac's dad resuscitated him and swore him to secrecy. This whole reveal felt so Friday the 13th to me. Like, those teens were too busy having sex to notice that my little Jason had fallen into the lake. They were making love while that young boy drowned. Jessica's got her hands down Sean's board shorts. Tucker's grabbing Kara. And I'm drowning. Anyway, he stumbles across Jackson turning into the Canima for the first time, and because the Canima seeks a master, they bond, and Matt uses Jackson to pick off all of the members of the class of 2006's swim team, including Isaac's dad. The swim team, you idiot! By the way, Jackson doesn't remember any of the attacks because every time he turns, he goes into a fugue state. A fugue state. So that's our mystery solved. Wouldn't you kill to have been a fly on the wall in this writer's room? But Matt is only our little bad guy. Our big bad guy is Gerard. Yeah, all you Teen Wolf fans have been waiting for me to talk about Gerard. Gerard Argent, also introduced in this season, is Allison's grandfather, whom she doesn't know very well. He turns out to be similar to his daughter Kate from last season, just very driven mad with his hatred of werewolves. After the gang faces off with Matt, Gerard captures and kills him, drowns him again, brutal, and then takes over the Canima himself. At first he says he wants to avenge Kate's death, so mainly it seems like he's trying to <laughs> kill all werewolves, question mark. The Wikipedia describes this as a werewolf genocide. I feel like genocide is a strong word for a dumb show about a made up species. But it's revealed that Gerard also wants the bite because he's dying of cancer and he wants to be cured via werewolfery which according to Microsoft Word is a real word that exists. You monster, not yet. But oh ho ho, maybe old Scotty isn't quite as dumb as a bag of rocks as we all thought, because right after Gerard gets bitten, Scott reveals that he's been replacing Grandpa Gerard's pills with capsules full of mountain ash, which is a thing that repels werewolves, which makes Gerard's body reject the bite, killing him, I thought, but not actually, and also leading to maybe the funniest moment we've seen so far. Mountain Ash! I'm obsessed in general with this performance from Michael Hogan as Gerard. He has this very unique, monotone cadence most of the time. You have a knack for creating a vivid picture, Mr. Stalinsky. Let me paint one of my own. And then he just went all out for his final moment. He's a true performer. But also after Gerard dies, he then disappears and it's not addressed again. So I guess he might return in later seasons. Not sure how he survived, you know. <laughs> The season ends with Derek and the homies discovering that a werewolf pack made entirely of alphas has come to town. That's more intense than a regular pack, I guess. So that's our setup for next season. Probably. An alpha pack. And they're not coming. They're already here. Oh, and amidst all this, Peter who apparently is not 100% dead somehow, I didn't really get the mechanics of this subplot, but whatever, is manipulating Lydia into helping resurrect him. At the end of the last season, Peter attacked Lydia during the school dance. However, she recovered from her bites with seemingly no turning, so everyone's thinking she might be immune, though she did go into a fugue state right after and run through the woods naked for a couple days. Lots of fugue states in this season, uh, so clearly something else is still going on. And one of those things is, for some reason, Peter can get inside her head and persuade her to help him out. It's really weird, actually. At first, he makes her hallucinate, like, a younger version of himself to flirt with her, then reveals himself. It's kind of like, what was the point of all that if she seemingly has no choice but to help you either way? <laughs> Ah! 
Lydia blows a bunch of wolfsbane fairy dust into Derek's face, which makes him pass out. She drags him to the spooky werewolf mansion. He doesn't live there anymore in this season. Instead, he's been hanging out in this spooky old abandoned bus station. Not sure which is worse. And she uses his blood to bring back Peter. Derek says that this will have consequences, but I'm still not really sure what those consequences are. I don't remember any happening. I still don't understand how any of this is possible, but the show told me it was. Another big thing this season, it's truly pretty impressive how much nonsense they managed to pack into 12 episodes, is that at one point, Allison's mom, who is styled crazily for her entire run on the show, by the way, tries to kill Scott with like, a wolf's bane vape. Derek comes to the rescue and ends up biting Allison's mom in self-defense. I was so excited when this happened because to me, like this is drama. This is what I want out of my rival family's werewolf show. I was sat there ready for the sweeping consequences this was clearly about to have. But I have to say, I think they missed a big opportunity here. My first thought was, oh, the obvious drama of having someone the Argent family loves being bitten is that they'll have this question of whether to kill her or let her stay alive and become a werewolf. And they do ask that question, but the problem is that they immediately answer it. And the answer is that she's immediately going to kill herself and that's going to be the end of that. Like we cut back to the Argents in the next episode and there's not even an argument. They're just all in agreement. Her husband seems kind of sad, but not that sad. It's a bite from an alpha. She's my wife. Chris is acting like my wife is having a hard time at work sad, not my wife is about to kill herself in my arms sad. What I would have loved to see is A, just this same progression of events, but stretched out longer. You know, show me the agony, show me more than one scene with Allison where the mom is trying to act like everything's okay. Show me the yelling, screaming fight between Chris and Gerard. Or B, they let her live and she turns into a werewolf. And first of all, now we have a sexy MILF werewolf, so that's a win. But also we have the drama of the Argents trying to hide the fact that one of their own is a werewolf. Maybe they have her like chained up in the basement. Maybe she defects to the other side. There's so much untapped drama here. They could have milked this for all it was worth and they didn't. So that was one of my problems with season two, but let's talk about the main one. Let's continue our discussion of why Scott sucks. I admit I found him a little better at times in this season than in the last. Like, at least they're trying to give him a little more agency in some things. He's doing a little more, affecting the plot a little more. But the performance is still giving us nothing, and he continues to shirk responsibilities to hang out with Allison. Like, there's one episode where Scott and Stiles kidnap Jackson in a stolen police vehicle. I'm pretty sure there are, like, at least three felonies happening here. But they're trying to prevent him from killing Killing more people as the Canima. At one point, Styles leaves Scott and Allison there to keep watch, and instead of keeping watch, they have sex in their car and fall asleep, and Jackson escapes. I did like, though, that in the scene, Scott and Allison's steamy sex montage is intercut with Jackson transforming into the Canima. Like, as a Scott hater, I was like, yeah, your romantic moment deserves to be juxtaposed with horrific footage of Colton Haynes turning into a lizard man. Scott also acts like an even worse boyfriend this season. At one point, Allison kind of has no choice but to spill some of the gang's secrets to her family, and she immediately tells Scott what happened, and he's fine with it. He's like, I understand. It's okay. It's not bad. If he knows, fine. Then later that day, <laughs> they're at this rave. Allison again is like, my family knows about the Canima, so they're here to look for it tonight. And Scott gets super mad at her. Just stay out of the way. Scott, Just stay out of the way! It's bizarre. Which is it, Scott? Were you even listening to her earlier? You just said it was okay. This launches them into a huge fight, after which Scott refuses to apologize. Once again, I hate him. Are you gonna apologize to Allison or what? Why should I apologize? I didn't do anything wrong. Now, on that note, let me talk about one of my favorite parts of the season in general that also exemplifies why Scott is a terrible character. 
In episode nine, Lydia is having a birthday party, and apparently her birthday parties are legendary, they're always the events of the season, so she's hyping it up a lot. By the way, birthday party wardrobe brought to you by Macy's. It's not the first time we've seen them on this show, and it won't be the last. Looking for a dress to get blood all over when you're brutalized by a werewolf at the Winter Formal? Stop by Macy's. Planning to change into a brand new hoodie before meeting up with your soon-to-be ex-girlfriend who's mourning her dead mother? Get it at Macy's. Need a birthday gift for the girl you've loved since childhood? Look no further than the Macy's Style Lab. This is embarrassing. Oh, Allison, you don't have a dress to wear to the party yet? You silly bitch. Lydia already picked one out for you. It's from Macy's and it is hideous. But enough about the great deals at Macy's. It turns out that ever since getting attacked by a werewolf and running through the woods, Lydia is not quite as socially revered as she once was. And nobody's really showing up to this party except Scott, Styles, and Allison. So Scott is like, oh, I guess I can call the lacrosse team. Styles is like, oh yeah, I'll call some friends I made the other night. I met them the other night. Let's just say they know how to party. It's not clear whether he means at the rave he was at the other night or at the gay bar he was at the other night, but this group of people shows up. We're here for the party. Every time I'm reminded of the fact that Scott and not Styles is the main character of this show, I just want to weep. So now the party's really getting started, but uh-oh, Lydia has spiked the punch with Wolfsbane, which makes everyone hallucinate. And again, maybe I'm missing something, but I feel like it's not super clear why she does this. It's clearly connected to the thing with Peter, but like, what did this achieve? Was it just supposed to be a distraction? But what matters is that all of our main characters are now having hallucinations of their worst fears. And dude, anyone who drank that crap, they're freaking out. And in retrospect, this is kind of a great exercise for our writers, right? This is a little excuse to dive deeper into the psyches of all of our characters. Allison has this hallucination that she's shot by herself, who criticizes her for being weak and cowardly. Jackson hallucinates these terrifying faceless people representing his unknown biological parents, and then his own face disappears. He clearly has all these complex identity issues. Styles has this heartbreaking vision of his dad becoming this abusive alcoholic following the death of Styles' mother, who sees Styles as a burden and hates that he has to take care of him. And what does Scott see, you ask? Well, he sees Allison making out with Jackson. Do you see what I'm saying? Every other character, even a pretty superficial antagonistic person like Jackson has clear emotional depth, complex, relatable insecurities. And then you have Scott over here, whose biggest insecurity, his deepest, darkest fear is that his girlfriend might cheat on him. What a terrible, terrible protagonist. How is it that they can write scene after scene between Styles and his dad that like move me to tears, but every time they try to have Scott have an emotional moment with anyone, I'm yelling at the screen. And before you say anything, I don't think it's just the acting. That's part of it, but I don't think it's all of it. Come to think of it, Scott barely has any emotional interactions with his mom. She even finds out he's a werewolf at the end of this season, and she's upset about it, but they never have any cathartic moment. It's like the show goes out of its way to not give Scott any depth. I wonder if they just forgot to. Oh, another thing, on a technical level, this season was really weird. Suddenly there's a lot of really shaky handheld camera, a lot of really goofy quick zooms. This scene in the science lab was awful. You get motion sick watching it. Like, chill, this isn't the Bourne identity. Actually, what it was reminding me of is this Bollywood action movie that I like called War. It's a really goofy film stylistically, and all of the camera work is like this. But that's like an over-the-top, homoerotic, nationalistic Bollywood Mission Impossible ripoff. This is allegedly a teen horror drama that we're supposed to take semi-seriously. It's just weird and really distracting. Um, miscellaneous funny stuff. This season introduces werewolves running on all fours, which I think is objectively ridiculous and impractical. We basically open with Scott running all over town on all fours, and it's like, that can't possibly be faster than regular running. It looks even stupider than the Twilight treadmill running. It's awful. Where's Derek? Now, 
Now, something established in season one is that werewolves can have emotional anchors, which are like a person or a thing that keeps you tethered to reality and lets you control your werewolf impulses better. Yes, it's contrived and fan fiction-y, but that's like the least of my worries right now. And in season two, we find out that Derek's emotional anchor is anger. <laughs> what is it for you? Anger. Which is not only really awkward to say, but also just an undeniably ridiculous idea. This season is also the first to feature a real opening credit sequence with actual footage. Prior to this, each episode would just play a little title card. Each character gets their little badass moment, except Styles, who just gets to walk in slow motion in front of his car. Just wanted to mention it, as I assume this will fluctuate as the show goes on. In one episode, Deaton gives Scott and Styles a syringe full of ketamine to try and tranquilize Jackson with at the rave, leading to this incredible out-of-context Styles moment. More ketamine. The man needs ketamine. Come on. Also in a different episode, Deaton wakes one of the werewolves up using a dog whistle. That sound. What was that? I just love it when the show makes clear that werewolves are not that far off from just being dogs. This one Scott outfit is probably the worst fashion moment I've seen on the show so far. A skin tight green v-neck over a long sleeve, come on. He probably bought it at Macy's too. Finally, before we move on to season three, here's a compilation of people roasting Scott in this season. All right, I get it. Just please shut the hell up before I have the urge to maim and kill myself. McCall, I don't know why, but your pain gives me a special kind of joy. <laughs> If you don't realize that, then you've got to be the stupidest bitch in this town. Well, other than Scott, since he's a pretty stupid bitch himself. But before we get into our final and longest season breakdown in classic Teen Wolf fashion, it's time for some product placement. You'll never believe who's sponsoring this video. It's Squarespace. At this point, I probably don't have to tell you about all of Squarespace's great features, but I'm going to anyway. Squarespace gives you all the tools you need to build a beautiful website, whether you're a business owner, a creator of content, or simply a werewolf enthusiast. Of course, they have a very user-friendly website builder with all kinds of customizable templates for whatever your needs may be. Your Squarespace site can host essentially any form of content you want, whether it's videos, images, podcasts, or blog entries. You can sell products or services easily and even set up subscriptions or memberships. And if security is important to you, you can lock your entire site or individual pages behind a password to make private or exclusive spaces. Though I'd recommend you don't make your password Allison. His password is also Allison. Squarespace is also a great place to buy a custom domain. It looks like wolfgirl.com is taken, but just think, you could be the proud owner of wolfgirls.com. This month, to soothe my tortured mind, I've been cataloging all of my academic resources on werewolf media on my site's blog section. Check it out, fellow alphas. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to wolf out, you can go to squarespace.com slash Mulcahy for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's Mulcahy as in Russell. Thanks, Squarespace, for making all my werewolf dreams come true. Trying to finish season three of this show feels like running a marathon, only it's a marathon you've never trained for, and it turns out to be two marathons disguised as one, and for the first half, they've established all of these arbitrary rules, these rules for running a marathon, and none of them make any sense. They're really convoluted and contradictory, and you keep being given more and more of these rules that someone is clearly making up right there on the spot. And then throughout the second half of the marathon, Dylan O'Brien is running next to you, and he won't stop, like, shaking and crying. And as much as you like Dylan O'Brien and you're happy to see him, it's kind of just uncomfortable and depressing. I think I have a relatively unpopular opinion of this season, but 
Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Season three of Teen Wolf picks back up four months after the events of season two. It's the beginning of the gang's junior year. The main things you need to know about our teen characters are that Scott and Allison are broken up or on a break or something, Styles has grown out his hair, and Lydia is currently single. See, at this point, the actor playing Jackson has left the show to go be on the CW, so the explanation they give is that Derek taught Jackson how to be a werewolf over the summer, and he has since left for London for some reason. So then you've talked to him? Uh, not since he left for London. You mean since his dad moved him to London? Whatever. He left. As soon as they mentioned that, I knew there would be an American werewolf in London reference. I mean, I'd be kind of concerned if there wasn't one. And seriously, an American werewolf in London? Like, that's not gonna be a disaster. Meanwhile, in Derek's neck of the creepy werewolf woods, Erica and Boyd have disappeared, so Derek, Isaac, and Peter have been looking for them. It's revealed that Boyd and Erica have been kidnapped by that alpha pack that was hinted at in the finale of the last season, so that's our main concern. For now. First off, there were a couple notable production changes between seasons two and three that I think are worth addressing. One is that for this season, MTV ordered 24 episodes instead of 12, making for a much longer season than in previous years. And with this, the showrunners decided to essentially split the season up into two parts, season 3A and 3B. These two halves have two distinct main storylines, and they were filmed separately. There was a short gap between the shoots for the A and B halves. It's almost like they could have just been two separate seasons. The second change is that with this season, the entire production of the show shifted from Georgia to LA. This is mostly noticeable in the locations of season three. The high school set is visibly completely different. It's much larger, sunnier. When we catch glimpses of the athletic field, it's huge as opposed to this little one from seasons one and two. The season introduces several new locations, like this giant loft apartment building where Derek lives, and this other giant apartment building where both the Argents and the Alpha Pack now live. I thought that was a hilarious detail, a killer sitcom setup if I've ever heard one. There's also this abandoned bank vault, the abandoned distillery, seemingly an entire abandoned mall. While watching this season, my roommates and I came up with a drinking game, and one of our big rules is drink every time a new abandoned location is introduced. As funny as the constant stream of random, atmospheric, warehousey locations is, I do think it kind of serves to make the world of the show less consistent and convincing. Like, seasons one and two feel much more like you're in this sleepy small town. The woods are foggy and claustrophobic. The high school looks like it could be a real small town high school. Season three isn't drastically different, but there is this kind of expanded, more generic vibe to a lot of the locations, in my opinion. They're now isn't as much about this world that feels that distinct from the worlds of other similar shows. But a bigger problem for me this season is that 50 to maybe as much as 75% of the time, I had no idea what the hell was going on. Characters will be giving exposition and it's just like word salad and my brain would kind of automatically tune out and stop listening. They cut off the head of the snake and the body dies. Only this isn't a snake, it's a hydra. And like Scott says, they're all alphas. I hope he isn't. You hope he isn't the serial killing dark droid who's been slashing people's throats. Yeah. I was watching a lot of these episodes in despair because I just knew that I was going to have to go on the Teen Wolf wiki later and painstakingly comb through the episode recaps. This was more of a problem in season 3A. 3B wasn't too bad, but in 3B, it feels like they had several ideas for the season and they decided to just try all of them at the same time and not rewrite or pare down anything. So I'm going to try to explain the plot of 3A as clearly as I can with the help of the Teen Wolf Wiki. And if you get lost, just believe me when I tell you that it's not my fault. This is what it's like to watch the show. The season opens with this confusing scene of a character we've never seen before helping Isaac escape from these weird looking identical alpha werewolf twins. We will find out who this girl is eventually, but for right now she is just a mystery woman. It turns out that these twins can meld into one big super werewolf. They're like Werewolf Voltron. 
And honestly, I can't remember if I came up with that joke or if it's a Styles joke that I'm paraphrasing. Form Voltron Wolf, you know, kick everyone's asses. We couldn't. I've had a lot of trouble remembering the events of this season. It's like I dissociated while watching it. So this episode really introduces the Alpha Pack. Here are the members of said Alpha Pack. Creepy twins Ethan and Aiden. Ethan is the gay one and Aiden is the straight one, I think. I'm not trying to be reductive by referring to them simply as the gay one and the straight one, but honestly, those are pretty much their only distinguishing traits. Then there's Ennis, who is kind of just a big, scary guy. He reminded me a little bit of David Harbour, but I couldn't really tell you why, he just did. Kali, who is probably the most entertaining member of the pack, her whole thing is that she has these huge, scary foot claws, toenail claws, and therefore is always barefoot so that she can attack people with her claws. It's so uncomfortable when she's on screen because you just know that this must be like a fetish thing for so many people. I almost don't want to show it. It feels vulgar. And finally, the pack leader, Dukalian. I hear there's some kind of a leader. He's called Dukalian. Yeah, I don't know why he's called that. You don't know why he's called that. Let's move on. Dukalian is a blind British werewolf. His accent is weird. We could barely tell he was supposed to be British at first. You really think I'm that boring? Don't throw me in with sociopaths like your uncle. I'm not sure how else to describe this, but Dukalian feels like a Vampire Diaries character. Keep in mind, I haven't seen the Vampire Diaries. I've just watched Jenny Nicholson's video about it probably 20,000 times, but I feel like Dukalian would be much more at home in that world. He feels like Teen Wolf's attempt at some sort of amalgamation of Klaus and Elijah and maybe also that weird guy who like did experiments on vampires. It feels like the show really wants him to come off as cool and scary and threatening, but he is none of those things. He's just really tepid and bland, and you forget about him anytime he's off screen. Anyway, I think what the Alphas want is for Derek to join their pack, and apparently to join their pack, an Alpha needs to kill a Beta from their own pack, or maybe all the Betas from their own pack. Like, this is what I was talking about. This is the minutia that starts to confuse me. At one point, Deucalion is trying to pressure Derek into joining the Alpha Pack and killing his own pack, and he gives this really lame speech about how scary and special he is. I am Death, destroyer of worlds! I am the Demon Wolf! See what I mean? He just comes off like such a tryhard. Meanwhile, alongside all of this, another plot is brewing. Animals in town have started to behave erratically. Early in the first episode, a deer launches itself through Lydia's windshield, and then later a flock of birds go crazy and fly straight through a classroom's windows. We find out from Deaton that all of the cats at the animal clinic have committed suicide. So, in addition to the animals, eventually people in town start to show up dead. Styles has this preschool friend whose birthday party he and Scott attend, who disappears and turns up dead along with a lifeguard at the local pool. Both of these teens were strangled with a garrote and had their throats cut, and Styles realizes that they were both virgins. So he starts worrying that someone in town might be sacrificing virgins. We're really doing this. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Derek, Scott, and Isaac find out that Boyd and Erica are being held by the Alpha Pack at the abandoned bank vault, drink for abandoned location. So they break in and find Boyd and Cora, a new character who is Derek's younger sister whom he thought was dead. I guess Peter and Derek thought she died in the Hale House fire, but she actually was in South America for six years and came back to find Derek, but got kidnapped by the Alpha Pack instead. Why did she go to South America in the first place? How was she able to go to South America as presumably a child? Why would she only have come back now? All good questions. Not sure we'll ever get answers. Also, let me just remind you that this means that Derek has two sisters, and their names are Laura and Cora. At the bank, Derek also finds Erica's dead body. Erica has been unceremoniously killed off screen. 
This is a funny detail. Um, while Derek and Scott are at the bank, Styles and Peter, who have been hilariously left alone together at Derek's apartment, figure out that the Alphas have been using the bank vault because the walls are made of moonstone, which apparently means that they've been blocking the moonlight from reaching Boyd and Cora, meaning they haven't transformed in four months, meaning that when they get out and do transform, they'll be crazy. They'll be like starved lions. They're the starved lions and you and Derek just stepped into the Coliseum. And like, while watching this, I had to ask, right? How is this any different from just keeping someone in like, a room with no windows. Like if you put a werewolf in a basement, surely the moonlight can't get in there, right? Why would it have to be moonstone? Isn't it enough to just block out the light? Is moonlight some kind of ethereal light force that can pass through solid surfaces? I just think this makes no sense at all. Also, sadly, the Alpha Pack eventually kills Boyd too. Kali does this messed up thing where she drops Boyd onto Derek's claws. I am once again asking how deep werewolf claws are supposed to be able to penetrate because they only ever look about half an inch long. But Boyd is now dead too. Poor Boyd. It's like I said in season two, we never really learn much of anything about Boyd. They hint at a couple of things about him in this season, but they never really go there. And now he's dead. What a thankless role. RIP, he did provide me with one of the only lines in this season that I found unironically funny. I didn't know you were back at school. Yeah, I would have told you, but we're not actually friends. Whatever. Back in the other part of the plot, another virgin gets murdered in the same way, so now Styles is sure that this is a pattern. There is human sacrifice afoot. I need to have sex, like right now. Someone needs to have sex with me, like today. Like, someone needs to sex me right now. But then another person gets sacrificed who wasn't a virgin, so that seems to suggest that this is more complicated than just virgins. Styles eventually goes to Deaton, and he's like, I've figured it out. I think it's druids. Triskelays, the bank logo, the mountain ash, all of it's from the Celtic druids. And it is, it's druids. We're really doing this. Not only do druids exist, but Deaton himself is a druid. And we eventually learn that some werewolves have a druid emissary, which is a druid that like, helps them and advises them. Ms. Morell, who was the school guidance counselor in the last season and is also Deaton's sister, is the druid emissary to Deucalion's Alpha Pack for some reason. Also, a druid who goes down the wrong path is called a Dirac, a dark druid, and that's what we're dealing with. There's a dark druid sacrificing people in town. So who's the dark druid? Well, <laughs> in a twist, it turns out to be the hot new English teacher, Jennifer Blake. Jennifer has been carrying on a romance with Derek. It's terrible, but we'll get to that. And it turns out that she is actually named Julia, and she was a druid emissary for Kali, the creepy foot lady alpha. But when Deucalion formed the alpha pack, he had all their alphas kill their druid emissaries for some reason. And on that note, I actually want to talk about a missed opportunity here. When Deucalion had everyone kill their druid emissary, Kali couldn't quite do it. She was too attached to Jennifer or Julia or whatever. And I was the one she couldn't kill. If you want to talk about soft spots, let's talk about Jennifer Blake. What was her name again? Julia. But yeah, Kali left Julia alive because she cared about her too much. And this causes some drama now in the present day because they're facing off as emissaries and they have this complex emotional history. I loved this. I was like, please give me the lesbian werewolf druid romance. I really thought it was gonna be canon that they had been in a relationship or something with the way they were talking about it. I could go back and finish it or I could let someone I love die peacefully. But they just don't go there. It's so stupid. This thing right here has way more emotional potential than whatever that mess with Derek was. They just showed us this brief backstory and I was invested. So I think this whole thing would have been way more interesting if they had just focused on the relationship between Jennifer and Kali and not made as much of Jennifer and Derek, but that's just me. Anyway, Julia survived, but was disfigured. And now she is sacrificing people in the hopes of growing strong enough to get revenge on the Alpha Pack. 
I think. In my opinion, from a funny perspective, the part of this storyline that I have to tell you about is the orchestra concert. There's this episode, the episode where we learn that Jennifer is the Dirac, and Jennifer has organized this memorial concert in honor of the recent human sacrifice victims. I organized it to honor the losses at the school, and, and now it just sounds really stupid, doesn't it? It's a bit of a weird choice, but nobody really questions it. So all these students, including Danny, and seemingly some teachers too, are playing in this concert. Everyone gathers to listen to it, but over the course of the performance, the music starts to shift. To quote the Teen Wolf wiki, the music has become dark and foreboding, with a hint of the Dirac death chant coming from the members of the chorus. Everyone's getting kind of uncomfortable, and then this pianist plays so hard that the piano strings snap, and one of them, like, slits her throat. I am so confused as to what the purpose of engineering this memorial concert was supposed to be. Like, from Jennifer's perspective, was this just a distraction? She tries to kill Lydia in this episode, so was it just to distract everyone while she kills Lydia? Was the intention to kill this pianist? Is that a sacrifice? She didn't die with all the ritual stuff, so I don't think that would make sense. It's just a very silly, dramatic scenario. I enjoyed it a lot. And speaking of Jennifer trying to kill Lydia, Lydia has been having all of these strange experiences in this season where she can seemingly sense when someone is going to die. Everyone is trying to figure out why she's able to do this. And when Jennifer kidnaps her, she realizes that Lydia is a banshee. The wailing woman, a banshee right before my eyes. And I guess in the mythology of this show, that means that she can sometimes sense when someone is going to die, and she occasionally screams really loud, but that's cool. Good for Lydia. Also, now is as good a time as any to mention that the star brand partner of this season is Icebreakers. The Icebreakers product placement is off the charts. Isaac is casually popping Icebreakers while being interrogated by the FBI. Ethan, the gay twin, who has struck up an on and off relationship with Danny, is seductively feeding him icebreakers. <sighs> that sexiest of mints, icebreakers. That's objectively not true, by the way. I feel like if anything, Altoids are probably the sexiest mint. Not sponsored, but you know, they're so strong and potent and they kind of have that dark academia thing going on. Aren't you glad you clicked on this video? This season also shows some love to Reese's, including in this hilarious moment. But that one over there, she's perfect for you. And perfect combinations are rare in an imperfect world. Sorry, flashback, Peter. I can't really take your cryptic metaphors seriously when you're alluding to peanut butter cups. So that's the druid stuff. The main bad, other than the alpha pack, is this Dirac. And then they also introduce this thing called the Nematon, which is essentially a giant magical tree stump. It was once a sacred druid tree, but now it's just the stump and it's still magical sometimes. It's located at a convergence of telluric currents. I don't care enough about this to try to explain what telluric currents are. All you need to know is that there's a really funny moment when the gang realizes that Beacon Hills has an unusual surplus of telluric currents, which may explain why it's such a hot spot for supernatural stuff, leading Styles to explain that Beacon Hills is like an actual beacon. Okay, now the weird thing about Beacon Hills is that it actually is a beacon. Anyway, the magical tree stump was dormant for a long time until Derek Hale killed his high school sweetheart on it. Oh, did I forget to mention the baby Derek kills his girlfriend episode? How silly of me. Season three, episode eight, Visionary is a crazy, unreliable narrator flashback episode that adds even more tragic backstory to Derek's tragic backstory. In this episode, Peter is telling Styles and Cora the story of Derek's tragic first love, and concurrently, Gerard is telling Scott and Allison the other side of the story that was happening at the same time, Deucalion's villain origin story. That's right, Gerard is still alive. He's just wasting away, 
still seeping black goo all the time. I was very happy to see Gerard again. More of this guy, please. Don't be so sure you'd be surprised how far some people would go to get rid of someone like Deucalion. But apparently when Derek was like 15, he was a basketball boy who fell in love with a cello girl named Paige. It's all very if I stay. I want to take this moment to say that I think this was a missed opportunity to make Derek a baseball boy because Tyler Hecklin is a baseball player. He almost went pro. He's appeared in multiple movies about baseball because he can play it. So that would have been a fun detail if Derek was like a baseball star in high school. Then in the present day, you can have some scene at some point that's like the baseball scene from Twilight, wherein Derek <laughs> reveals his epic baseball skills. Which, sorry, let me also take a moment to say that did you know that Tyler Hecklin was offered the role of Emmett in Twilight? I wouldn't be that upset if it weren't for the fact that that movie contains the most iconic baseball scene in the history of cinema. Come on, Tyler. Anyway, Peter, morally ambiguous guy that he is, basically manipulated Derek into thinking that changing Paige into a werewolf was the only way for her and Derek to be together. In the present, as Peter's telling this story, he spins it like all of his malicious ideas and bad decisions were actually Derek's, which Styles ultimately doesn't believe. He clocks him as an unreliable narrator. But back in the day, Peter had Ennis, the alpha pack guy, try to turn Paige, which backfired. The bite didn't take, and she was dying a slow, painful death, so she begged Derek to put her out of her misery, which he did. This is where I killed my girlfriend. Excuse me? Peter explains that this is why Derek's eyes glow blue when he's a wolf. Apparently, if you're a werewolf and you've killed an innocent person, your eyes go from yellow to blue. Dimming the once brilliant golden yellow to a cold, stale blue. Can I just say that I hate this detail? First of all, it's very clear that they only thought to make this a thing at this moment in this season. It's a page from what my roommates and I have lovingly christened the Bullshit Bible. That's the book that we imagine the writers get all their stupidest, most on-the-spot ideas from. Stuff like druid emissaries and the detail of alphas being able to see the memories of another werewolf if they stick their claws into the back of their neck in just the right way. But also, I think it's just way cooler and honestly more marketable to make it more like the color of a werewolf's eyes depend on like who they are or their personality in some way. Because let's be real, the main audience for this show, at least at the time, was like little girls, right? <laughs> like 14-year-old girls. And you know what tween girls love, especially tween wolf girls? Customizable elements of one's appearance dependent on one's personality traits and or superpowers. Like, come on, what's a more appealing characteristic for your wolf OC? Having, like, purple eyes because you're a healer wolf or something? Or just having blue eyes because you've killed before? That might sound like a confusing question to some of you, but in my opinion, the answer is clear. Anyway, through Gerard's story, we learn that Deucalion became a villain after Gerard blinded him and framed him for a bunch of murders, I think. So that's that, I guess. There's a very dumb part of the season when Scott, Isaac, and Derek all have a big face-off with the Alpha Pack at this unexplained abandoned mall, drink for abandoned location, and basically they get creamed. Scott is badly wounded and Derek seems dead, <laughs> so his pack just runs with that assumption, despite it obviously not being true. We learn all of this in a series of flashbacks while our high school gang is on a bus traveling to a cross-country meet. This is all extremely confusing to watch in real time, partly because of this nonlinear timeline, but mostly just because this big battle seems fairly unmotivated. I think Scott was just trying to confront Deucalion by himself, but Isaac wanted to tag along, and then Derek just decides to show up for some undefined reason. It seems like the writers wanted to have a big battle and have Scott be injured and Derek presumed dead, but they couldn't really think of a good reason to have a big battle, so they just didn't really bother coming up with one. I didn't mind the bus part of the episode, though. I love a good bottle episode. 
fun fact, there's a character in this episode, Jared, who's actor, as well as this actress who showed up in season two and a couple episodes of season three, apparently won their roles in a contest. MTV ran a contest in 2011 on Facebook where fans just had to like the page and post a video, I guess explaining why they wanted it, and you could win a walk-on part. So that's funny. It feels like something Disney Channel would do, you know? At the end of this episode, Derek is revealed to be alive, but nobody cares. We all knew he was alive. That doesn't matter. What matters is the next episode, Motel California. I should disclaim right here that this episode deals with suicide, like a lot of suicide, and while it is incredibly cartoonish, it is still graphically concerned with suicide. So if that's not your cup of tea, you can skip to right here. So, Motel California. When we started watching this episode, I was convinced that this must have been the Halloween episode of season three, because everything checks out. It is conceptually and tonally removed from everything else in the season and seems to feature a level of supernaturality that is somewhat beyond the scope of what usually exists in this show. So yeah, Halloween episode, obviously. But then I looked it up and found out that this episode premiered in July, so I guess it is just weird and disconnected from everything else in the show for no reason, which I would argue is worse. Here's what it reminds me of. Some of you might have seen my videos on the show 13 Reasons Why, and I'm not sure I would necessarily recommend them. Like, I think I still agree with basically everything I said, but I made them a long time ago before I had any subscribers, and I feel like the production and structure isn't quite up to what I try to achieve these days. But in that video, I spend a while talking about the season four episode, Senior Camping Trip. That episode of 13 Reasons Why is extremely bizarre. It's like 13 Reasons Why trying to do a horror movie. The tone is ridiculous. The events are ridiculous. It feels like the show's attempt at a Halloween episode. Basically, Teen Wolf's Motel California and 13 Reasons Why's senior camping trip are birds of a feather. They are brothers, evil alpha werewolf twin brothers, if you will. The episode takes place in this creepy motel in the fictional town of Fairvale, California, which is also the town from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. The episode seems to be trying to homage a couple different classic horror movies, but it's not really clear what the intention behind any of it is. Continuing directly from the events of the bus episode, Coach Finstock has the kids stop at this motel for the night because the cross-country meet has been postponed. And I cannot stress to you enough how much this would never happen. <laughs> I know it's not that important, but I went to a hippie Montessori school for most of my high school years, and we went on a lot of overnight camping trips. And I can assure you that an overnight school trip is a very delicate thing. In the last episode, Allison and Lydia, who had been following behind the bus in their car, eventually decide to just join the others, like get on the bus and continue the journey with them. And it's like, no, the teacher would constantly be doing head counts. You can't just add random people. They're not even on the cross country team. And then with this motel thing, I mean, first you would probably call everyone's parents. And even if you did have to put everyone up at a hotel or something, there would be strict rules about who can bunk with whom and whatever. In this scenario, they are ostensibly allowed to stay in a room with whoever they want. Everyone on this field trip is getting pregnant. I don't know what else to say. So soon our characters begin to behave strangely. Boyd is acting weird, Scott is acting weird, Isaac is watching static on the TV like he's in Poltergeist, Lydia is hearing and seeing ghostly memories of past suicides that happened at the hotel. Lydia tries talking to the motel clerk, and she's like a horror movie cliche creepy old lady who reveals that her motel has the highest number of suicides in all of California, 198. More than any other motel in California. We have the most guest suicides. That, that is a lot. But it seems like only really the werewolf characters are being affected. And they all try to kill themselves. Maybe you're somehow involved in getting people to kill themselves, you know? This is so, like, can we talk about this? 
This isn't the first time the show has taken a really serious topic and just made a complete werewolf farce out of it. The other one that comes to mind is how in season two, when Isaac was introduced, he was being really brutally abused by his dad, including, disturbingly, this thing where his dad would sometimes lock him inside a freezer in the basement. They bring that up again in this episode, by the way. And with this episode, I realize that the discourse on depicting suicide in teen media probably didn't really heat up in the mainstream until the release of 13 Reasons Why, but I personally think that the adult writers of this show should have known better than to do this. Watching this episode 10 years later is pretty astounding. I feel like a show for teens would never, ever do something like this today. Basically, I don't approve of this. I think Jeff Davis should be a little ashamed. Anyway, the werewolves are trying to kill themselves. Ethan tries, but Styles, Allison, and Lydia manage to stop him. Boyd tries, but they manage to stop him. And then, finally, Scott tries. And do you know what he does? The gang rush outside to find Scott drenched in gasoline, holding a road flare, prepared to blow himself up. Typical Scott moment, am I right? There's no hope. So everyone has to talk him down from the ledge, but it rings kind of untrue and weird because we know he's just under some sort of spell that makes him want to do this. It's not authentic, so it's weird to see the authentic Styles tears. And this is all just so stupid and insensitive. Why would anyone write this? But whatever, they save him and the next day they discover wolfsbane powder inside of Coach's whistle. So they suspect that maybe the wolfsbane is what caused the hallucinations. In general, they think the Dirac, the Dark Druid, is the one who engineered this whole plot. But I don't think it's ever truly explained, like, who did this and or why. I don't know about this. If it was Wolfsbane, which canonically causes hallucinations to everyone, not just werewolves, as seen in Season 2, Episode 9, Party Guest, then why would only the werewolves try to kill themselves? And why suicide specifically? Does Wolfsbane powder now have the power to A, make you pass out, but only if you're a werewolf, B, give you hallucinations of your worst fears, regardless of whether you're a werewolf, and C, make you suicidal, but only if you're a werewolf? I'm ready to stop talking about this episode. So at the end of season 3A, Jennifer slash Julia slash the Dirac has kidnapped everyone's parents. She kidnapped the sheriff and Scott's mom. And then stupidly, Chris Argent got really cocky and was like, don't worry, Allison, I can take her before immediately also getting kidnapped. No offense, but what's the difference between you and them? I'm carrying a 45. Oh. <laughs> so the parent squad are all tied up in this root cellar that is located directly under the Nemeton. And I guess the Dirac is going to sacrifice them to give her her full power? Question mark? Or give the tree its full power? You know, something like that. So the kids of these three, Scott, Stiles, and Allison, come up with this deranged plan with the help of Deaton to submerge themselves in ice baths so that they'll enter a death-like trance in which they can go into the spirit world or something, see the Nemeton, and I guess locate their parents. I was just, at this point in the season, I was like, fuck it, <laughs> whatever. I don't understand it, but I'm just going where the ride takes me. If you're a diehard Teen Wolf fan watching and you notice me making any mistakes with details of the plot or the timeline, I'm sorry, I truly tried my very best. So the three of them do this, but Deaton's like, be warned, doing this will give you a darkness around your heart or soul or whatever, and that will follow you for the rest of your lives. But you'll feel it every day for the rest of your lives. It'll be a kind of a darkness around your heart. The kids don't care. I can't be alone in thinking that there must be an easier, less risky way to find their parents. Like, don't werewolves have smell powers? Maybe they explained that away at some point, but I don't know, I would try some other things first. Actually, no, this is really confusing because after they do this ritual and locate the Nemeton, they then also go find stuff belonging to their parents so that they can scent it to find their location. So, 
Like, am I missing something? What was the point of this ritual? See what you can find in my dad's closet, anything with a strong scent. So they do this, they kind of figure out where the nematon is, they wake up, and Deaton is like, you guys have been out for 16 hours. We've been in the water for 16 hours, and the full moon rises in less than four. I'm sorry, what? I get that this is a supernatural druid ritual, I get that, but also, Styles and Allison are just humans. How did they survive underwater without oxygen for 16 hours? And as if that wasn't bad enough, there's a lunar eclipse coming up during which werewolves will lose all of their powers. And because these three overslept in their ice baths, the lunar eclipse is in only four hours. And the full moon rises in less than four. While looking for stuff belonging to their parents, Scott, Allison, and Isaac get sidetracked by Scott's dad. That's right, right before they went into the ice baths, Styles was like, oh, by the way, Scott, your dad is back in town. Your dad's in town. <sighs> Styles knows this because Scott's dad is an FBI agent, so he's been talking to Styles' dad. And oh boy, if we thought we hated Scott, we are really gonna hate Scott's dad. A Stolinsky at the center of this whole mess, what a shocker. He is only insufferable when he's on screen, so I'm probably not gonna mention him much from here on out. Styles, on his way back from finding something of his dad's, gets into a car accident. He crashes his Jeep right into a tree and is knocked unconscious. And I am once again saying fuck Scott and everyone else, because when the other three are on their way to try to make a truce with Deucalion at the abandoned distillery, drink for abandoned location, someone's like, should we get Styles? And someone else is like, no, there's no time. Still haven't gotten anything from Styles, you? I don't get it. All right. Oh, we can't wait for him. Come on. Styles could have been dead. Anyway, Styles turns up in the root cellar just in time to save everyone with this baseball bat. The baseball bat thing annoys me, and here's why. In this season, they try to make the baseball bat Styles' thing. Like, because he's a human, it's a little joke. Like, you guys all have werewolf powers, I have the bat. Boy, you got claws, I got a bat! The reason it annoys me is that way back in season one, using a baseball bat to defend themselves was like Scott and his mom's thing. I'm not mad that they took something from Scott. Frankly, I'm in favor of taking everything from Scott. I'm just mad that instead of giving him his own thing, they just gave Styles this lame hand-me-down thing. They rescue the parents, and concurrently there's this big showdown between Scott, Derek, Jennifer, and Deucalion. Basically, Deucalion kills Jennifer or like wounds her really badly. Uh, Scott and Derek decide to just let Deucalion go for some reason. My mother told me you were a man of vision once. We're letting you go because we hope you can be that man again. It's really stupid. They're like, just this once, we're gonna trust you to become a better person in the future. And during this fight, Scott shows that he is now an alpha leading me to another stupid part of this season. Earlier in the season, we learned from Deaton that Scott is something called a true alpha. This is a type of alpha that, instead of killing an alpha to take the title, is like specially predisposed to naturally become an alpha just based off of the strength of their character and stuff. They call it a true alpha. It's one who rises purely on the strength of the character by virtue, by sheer force of will. Basically, Scott is just so special and talented and cool and amazing that he is literally the chosen one. He is a true alpha. He is the specialist boy. This is so obnoxious, but also so funny because what this means is that Scott was such a bad character <laughs> that they had to write in a contrived, arbitrary reason for him to be the most important person on the show. This guy, this guy is the awesomest, most desirable werewolf ever, and everybody wants him in their pack. This guy. His password is also Allison. You still want him in your pack? And we did it. Season 3A over. And it only took us 6,000 words. But wait, there's more other than the entire other half of this season. It's time for my Derek rant. Let's do this.
So in this season, Derek has a romance for the first time on the show. He enters into a relationship with Ms. Blake, Jennifer, Julia, the hot Duroc English teacher. And I have problems with this. Before you judge me, assuming that I'm just possessive over this fictional guy, or that I have like a ship that it interferes with or something, let me explain. It's not any of that. Allow me to go on a little tangent. In my opinion, this show has really fallen off in terms of the characterization of Derek. I think maybe they cared about it a little bit in season one, but as early as season two decided that he was basically just a hot guy, <laughs> a kind of mean but hot guy. As early as season two, he is relegated to essentially whatever the writers want or need him to be in any given scene. They exploit his tragic backstory when it suits them, but you never get the sense that his trauma is something that truly affects who he is. We'll see him be sad or angry in the occasional individual scene, but then as soon as that's over, he's back to just being Derek. I know that in real life, of course, we all have moments when we're emotional and moments when we're not, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that it never seems to follow through into any kind of arc, and there's also very little consistency. After season one, sometimes he's a stone-faced loner, but other times he seems to be able to turn on the charm, which I think is bad. <laughs> Let's talk about how we could have characterized Derek. You know, if you and I were in charge. You're a great writer. I trust you to work with me on this. So in season one, as I've already covered in this video, Derek is a total weirdo loner. And I love that. I find it very unique and entertaining to watch. And I think there could have been some opportunities for fun characterization as a result of that, but the show squanders these opportunities. Let's take this moment early in season two when Derek and Stiles are trying to break Isaac out of jail. They need to get past the front desk so that they can get the keys to the holding cells. So Derek is like, it's fine, I'll just distract her. And Stiles is like, really, you, you're gonna distract her? You're a total weirdo. But Derek is, is really confident that he can do this. Okay, fine, what's your plan? To distract her. So he goes in and he totally successfully flirts with this woman at the front desk. He's just completely competent at flirting and using his masculine wiles. Now, I hope it goes without saying that I think this is a huge misstep, a huge missed opportunity. I think something that would have made for a really funny scene and also opened a door for some fun Derek characterization is if they had done this whole thing where Derek confidently asserts that he'll flirt with this person to distract her, and then he goes in and like totally fucks it up. He's really awkward and bad at it, and you're like, oh yeah, he hasn't talked to anybody in like six years. This man hasn't been on a date since high school. This man lives in the woods. He probably doesn't have a cell phone, doesn't watch TV. I would just love it if the whole thing with Derek was like, he's a really good looking guy and he acts really badass and stoic whenever he's fighting someone or dealing with a supernatural problem, but the second he's in a normal social setting, he just becomes the weirdest, lamest, most socially awkward guy ever. I think the Derek I wanted does exist in season one, and I think this one scene achieves my dream. There's this episode where he's on the run, and for some reason he has decided to hide out at Styles' house. I feel like they don't quite explain that one. I get that he's not safe at his spooky werewolf mansion, but surely it would make more sense to go to Scott's house. But yeah, he's at Styles' house, and the two of them need help tracing a text. So Styles decides to ask Danny, who is apparently a master computer hacker. I don't think that really gets brought up much again, but it should have. So Styles asks Danny over under the guise of working on their science project or whatever, and Derek is just sitting silently in the background. Styles' dad is not home at this point, so I'm not sure why Styles wouldn't just ask Derek to go hang out in another part of the house, but whatever. Scene has to happen. Get out, go make yourself some pizza rolls, Derek. Also, while editing my season one review, I noticed this really funny production design detail where they have Derek sitting there, like pretending to read a book and it looks like he's pretending to read like the dictionary anyway Danny's like who is that who's he again um my cousin Miguel 
Danny's like, is that blood on his shirt? And Styles is like, yeah, he gets these terrible nosebleeds. Yes, well, he gets these horrible nosebleeds. Hey, Miguel. I thought I told you you could borrow one of my shirts. This is like a scene I would write. <laughs> and Danny is reluctant to help them trace the text. So Styles starts making Derek change his shirt a bunch of times. I think what's happening here is Styles is basically bribing Danny with Derek's hot bod. You swing for a different team, but you still play ball, don't you, Danny boy? You're a horrible person. I didn't think I found this scene that funny when I first watched it, but then a couple weeks ago, I was trying to describe it to my friends like I'm doing now, and I realized that it's probably one of my favorite scenes. The dictionary is really what makes it. But essentially, for me, this is prime Derek usage. Like, when he's not doing serious supernatural stuff, I think he should be inserted into scenes as a weird guy who can contrast with everyone else. While watching season three, we get to a part where Derek and Chris Argent are in jail together because Styles framed them for murder. It's a long story. We'll get there. And we were kind of tickled at how odd of a couple this was. Like, it was fun to watch these two hang out because we've never really seen that. And then one of my roommates made the comment that whenever Derek is paired with anyone in the show, it feels like an odd couple because Derek is just such a weird guy. And I really agree with this. And if they had really went for it, with Derek being weird and socially awkward, these moments would be even better, and we would get more of them, but they didn't. And we don't. So, all of that to say <laughs> that the romance we get between Derek and Jennifer is crazy and painful to watch. This relationship begins when Jennifer finds herself trapped at the school after hours with our two moon-starved werewolves trying to kill her, and Derek takes one for the team and goes in to protect her. This is why you should never stay at work after hours, girl. You're a high school teacher. They are not paying you enough to be here working at like 10 p.m. A couple days later, he visits her at school. By the way, I'm just gonna say it right now. Derek, you've gotta stop creeping around the high school. You could get away with it in season one because your actor was the same age and in some cases younger than some of the teen actors, but three seasons in, with this full beard, it's not working. It's starting to look a little odd. Like, does he stop by the office for a visitor's pass when he does this? Or does he just slink through a window or something? It's probably the latter. And that's alarming. Anyway, he visits her at school and they have some painful back and forth about the crucible because she's an English teacher. I have to start two dozen teenagers on the crucible and I honestly have no idea what I'm gonna say. Well. Why don't you start by telling them that it's an allegory for McCarthyism? I love stuff like this in media where they want to make someone look smart about literature, but either the writers themselves are not that smart, or they just don't want it to go over the heads of their child audience, so they make it a really basic factoid. Damn, The Crucible was an allegory for McCarthyism? I never would have guessed. Next, you're gonna tell me that funny story about the pigs was actually about Stalin. This isn't the last exchange they have about literature, and it's awful every time. You know how many characters in literature use a false death to their advantage? You ever read Les Mis? Tale of Two Cities? <laughs> Romeo and Juliet? Ignore the sun. I can't... I can't control the sun, sorry. Then, after Derek is injured in that abandoned mall fight, he goes to Jennifer for help for some reason. They have sex before he heals? He heals after? It's really unpleasant to watch. What if doing this is actually the best thing that I could do for everyone else? <laughs> And basically from that point on, they are acting like they have been in love for lifetimes. They are so into each other after like two days. They are soulmates. It's already weird and embarrassing that Jennifer is acting like this, but it's downright bizarre that Derek is acting like this. Again, I'm struggling to believe that this guy who has no friends, who probably hasn't dated since high school, who is so closed off and angry all the time, would be this competent at dating and falling in love. I just think it's really weird. It comes out of nowhere. The result is that it feels super generic and weightless because this is so out of character and unearned. Now, some of you who have watched the show might be yelling at the screen right now, like, Jane, it makes sense that their relationship makes no sense because Jennifer turns out to be evil and she was deceiving him this whole time. And 
No, person I just made up in my head, I disagree with you. Admittedly, this did make me forgive this storyline a little more than I would have otherwise. Like, yes, on her side, it could explain why she was so quick to dive into it. But as I've explained, my main problem here is Derek's behavior, and he has no idea what's going on with her. This is ostensibly his authentic romantic self. It just doesn't work. And also, I do think that in real life, or even in a TV show, it could happen that a guy like Derek, who's super traumatized and closed off, might react by being overly romantic or eager to get into relationships. Like maybe you could argue that him latching on to this attachment so fast and so intensely is itself a trauma response. But that's clearly not what the show intended to do. There's no commentary on the fact that he's doing this. It's treated like completely normal behavior on his part. All in all, this was just one of the most difficult parts of the season to watch, and it really made me think about what I wish the character of Derek could be. I think if Derek were to date anyone, it would have to be someone as weird as him or someone who's charmed by his weirdness. You can't just have him date a basic seeming character by way of writing him to be equally basic in all his scenes with her, despite that not being his character. However, I will say I would kind of love it if it just became a running gag on this show that Derek only dates people who turn out to be villains. He just keeps accidentally dating people who eventually betray him and try to kill all of his friends. Okay, Derek rant over, and it only took me 2,000 words. I'm supposed to be working on my film thesis paper right now, like for my degree. Know how long it's supposed to be? 10,000 words. And do you know how much I just wrote in two days just about season 3A of Teen Wolf? 8,500 words. Maybe I could just turn this in. I don't go to a very good university. They probably wouldn't fail me. Before I started writing it, I really thought I'd be able to shoot all of my season three review in one sitting, like the previous two seasons. But uh, here we are. Probably not the best idea to bring alcohol into the mix, but like, what do I have left to lose? It should be noted that for season 3B, they make the opening credits sequence all red and spooky. Shit's getting real this season. I also realize I didn't mention the opening sequence while talking about 3A, but as I predicted, they have altered it slightly. Namely, they add a big wolf match cut to Derek's segment, which is pretty hilarious. And even funnier, they have this shot of Scott rising up from the earth, like <laughs> levitating. Anyway, picking up from where we left off, Scott, Styles, and Allison, having performed that druid ice bath ritual in the first half of the season are now suffering the consequences. You know how Deaton was like, ooh, be careful, you're gonna have a darkness around your heart now? Yeah, that's happening, I guess. Allison is having these visions of her dead aunt Kate and keeps almost murdering people with her vast array of weapons before someone just barely manages to get her to snap out of it in time. I kept watching this like, please, you guys, stop giving Allison access to all of these deadly weapons. I get the arrows are her thing, but... This has happened several times now. Just take them away until you figure it out. Scott is pretty much unable to control his werewolf powers now that he has assumed his status as a true alpha. Who cares? But Styles is definitely the worst off. He's having these crazy nightmares, screaming himself awake every night, and it's getting so bad that he's having difficulty distinguishing between dreams and reality. He can't always tell if he's dreaming or not. Something that helps him tell is counting how many fingers people have, because you might have extra fingers in dreams. But hilariously, one of the things keeping him from being able to tell is that a lot of the time he can't really decipher written words anymore. It's like when you're dreaming and you try to look at a book or some piece of writing and you can't read because you're dreaming. I'm not kidding. A big part of Styles' whole thing at the beginning of season 3B is that he can't read. One more the last few days, I've been having trouble reading. Styles has become Jared, 19. Who would like to come up and read aloud for us? Mr. Selinski, how about you? I'm Jared, could you read number 23 for the class? No, I cannot. What up, I'm Jared, I'm 19, and I never fucking learned how to read. There's a scene where Lydia almost gets stuck in a bear trap. It's a long story, whatever. And she's like, Styles, read the instructions on the trap to figure out how to disarm it. And he's like, I can't. <laughs> With you, we got a problem. 
I can't read either. This was supposed to be a serious, tense scene, but for me, it was impossible to take seriously. But that's not all. This season, how do I put this? This is the season that tries to make Styles into the ultimate soft boy Tumblr sexy man. That is seriously the only way I can think to describe it. I might just have to come back to this because you need the context of the plot first and then I can describe to you what I mean by that. I hope the suspense is killing you. I can feel these reviews getting less and less focused as I write them. So yes, Styles is in a lot of anguish at the start of this season. He's losing a lot of sleep and losing his grip on reality. Meanwhile, there's a new girl at school. Her name is Kira. She dresses like an e-boy who just spent all his birthday money at the local Hot Topic. And her main defining traits are that she comes from a supernatural family and she is the new love interest for Scott. It's like the gay twin thing. I promise I'm not trying to be reductive. It's just like, that's all the show is telling me about this character. Her first sort of date with Scott is that she has him over at her house for sushi and Scott somehow has never had that before and virtually has no idea what it is. I feel like white person doesn't understand sushi has become a sort of narrative shorthand for a very specific, very annoying type of cultural interaction in movies and TV, and I don't like it. Not so much because I'm like offended on behalf of white people, but more because we're usually supposed to find it like endearing that the white person doesn't know anything about sushi and finds it gross, and I don't find it endearing. I find it lame and cringe. You live in California, Scott. I get that it's supposed to be a small town, but like this is your high school. If you are completely ignorant to sushi, that is your own fault. The year is 2014, Scott. They sell sushi at the grocery store. The white people grocery store. Anyway, I'm a little annoyed at some of the ways the show decided to frame Kira, but I don't dislike her as a character. She's certainly not any more bland or fickle as Allison as a character, right? Kira's dad, who is the new history teacher at school, his thing is that he's constantly accidentally embarrassing her, and I liked that. I think that's an endearing dynamic to give to your parent-kid relationship. Or you might not, since she's never actually mentioned anyone from school, or brought home a friend for that matter. Kira, you forgot all the research you did for that boy you like. But the important part is Kira's mom is secretly a kitsune, which is a Japanese fox spirit. And thus Kira is also a kitsune, and she manifests these powers for the first time shortly after being introduced. We should just establish now that this half of the season is all about Japanese mythology, and not all of it is going to be particularly sensitive, and I highly doubt that all of it is necessarily even accurate to the real mythology, just to let you know that now. So speaking of that, Styles is trying to interpret his dreams, and he has this one specific one where he's in class and everyone is speaking in sign language, and Deaton helps decode this because, of course, Deaton knows sign language. I'm pretty sure Deaton just knows whatever the narrative needs him to know at any given time. You know sign language? I know a little. And they realize that the people in Styles' dream were signing the riddle, when is a door not a door? When is a door not a door? Essentially, the explanation given is that performing the druid ritual with the nematon, that's the magical tree stump in case you forgot, sort of opened some doors in a supernatural sense. The three kids who did the ritual are particularly vulnerable to supernatural nonsense at the moment. The door is still open? Ajar. A door into our minds. And because at this point the showrunners have clearly realized that Dylan O'Brien is the best actor, they've decided that Styles is the lucky winner who gets to be victimized by a supernatural entity this half season. Somebody in the writer's room was like, hear me out. What if we took this guy? What if we took this little cute little guy and we just put him through the ringer? We throw this guy in the garbage disposal. We tumble dry this guy on low for three hours. We microwave this little bastard on high for 10 minutes. So they did. In this half of the season, Styles, after all of his dream anguish, ends up getting possessed by something called the Nogitsune, which is like a Kitsune, but way more evil. It's a dark Kitsune, whatever that means. We're told that the Nogitsune is a trickster spirit that feeds on chaos and pain and stuff, 
so he basically just likes to fuck shit up as much as possible. Eventually, towards the end of the season, we get this crazy flashback episode explaining the origin story of the Nogitsune. Buckle your seatbelts! So first off, because Kira's mom, Nishiko, is a kitsune, she is 900 years old, you know, because she's a mythical being and such. So in this one episode, we flash back to Noshiko's life in the 1940s. In these flashbacks, they have her played by Arden Cho, who normally plays Kira, Noshiko's daughter. But prepare yourself for this. Back in the 1940s, Noshiko was living in a Japanese internment camp near Beacon Hills. We're doing this. This is what I was talking about. You know, Teen Wolf, you can't keep using stuff like this in your dumb werewolf story. This is serious. Suicide, child abuse, Japanese internment camps, apparently it's all fair game to our boy Jeff. It's hard to explain, right? Because media like this obviously deals with some serious stuff like death and injury and murder, and it's not like serious issues or even serious historical events are off limits for genre fiction. I don't think it should be like that. But there's a difference to me when it's something like Teen Wolf that is not generally interested in tackling political issues or sending messages about serious subject matter. Do you know what I mean? The inclusion of something like Japanese internment camps here doesn't feel like an earnest, well-thought-out attempt at social commentary or a well-meaning message. It feels like they're just using this extremely harrowing, sensitive historical injustice as a cheap plot device for their stupid bastardization of Japanese folklore. All, I must say, in service of giving us the feels for our favorite little white dude. I'm not trying to cancel Teen Wolf. It's not like it really matters at this point anyway. I just want to say that I think this sucks. And if you're mad at me for reading too much into it or being too woke or whatever, um, kindly go chew on some mountain ash until you feel like you can be more normal about things. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this episode is set in a Japanese internment camp, and Nishiko has been carrying on an illicit affair with this white army medic. I forget his name, it doesn't matter, ultimately. A pneumonia outbreak happens in the camp, and because it's the fault of this corrupt doctor who, like, sold all the medicine, a huge riot breaks out, ending in both Nishiko being shot and almost killed, and a fire that leaves her army medic boyfriend burned all over his body. He dies soon after. Nishiko got so angry that she asked her ancestors to make a nogitsune take over her body and get revenge, but instead it possesses her boyfriend's dead body and kills everyone. This means that in this season, whenever we see it in its full form, the nogitsune is this bandaged mummy guy wearing an army jacket. I think this character design is kind of lame, personally, but they can't all be winners. Also, I know Nishiko was really mad, but I have to ask, like, why would anyone ever summon a Nogitsune? Is, is it not on the record that it does this? That it's just like an unstoppable chaos monster who won't do what you ask and will instead make everything much worse for everyone? But what's done is done, and she killed him with like a magical sword, I think, and put his spirit into a fly and buried it under the Nemeton. Part of the kitsune lore is that they have these nine powerful tales, but that's confusing because in the show it's not actual tales, it's like weapons? Shout out to this quote about it on the wiki. Somehow, kitsunes can be represented in physical items like Nishiko's knives or Kira's Hira Shuriken. This transformation of tales into physical knives went unexplained during season three. I often worry that when something on this show doesn't make sense, it's just me not being smart enough to understand the story or not paying enough attention, so I feel very seen by this quote. Actually, while we're at it, probably my favorite feature of the Teen Wolf wiki is that whenever there's product placement, the very detailed episode recaps will note the exact product and model and stuff. It's so funny. Scott complies, and we see he is upgraded to the new Garnet Red Samsung Galaxy S3 from AT&T. Chris Argent is loading groceries into his Toyota RAV4. The class exits, but Lydia is drawn to a Samsung Galaxy Note 2 that is propped up on the piano. Styles gets a text from Lydia on his Nokia Lumina. He says perfect combinations are rare while opening and eating a Reese's peanut butter cup. In Derek's Toyota FJ Cruiser on the way to the hospital, Cora holds a bottle of Aquafina to Derek's mouth. 
So that's the story of the Nogitsune, and I guess all the druid stuff in season three allowed it to escape and jump right into the loving arms of Styles' brain. This is our main conflict for season 3B, and let me tell you, it yields some very funny situations. So after it causes some chaos, Deaton manages to put a bit of a pause on the Nogitsune's powers by injecting Styles with wolf lichen, because I guess that works somehow, but this is only temporary. This leads to another example of what I mean when I say this season is trying to make Styles into this perfect little huggable soft boy. A while after this, it's revealed that the wolf lichen has given Styles these scars on his body, like the ones you get from being struck by lightning. Do you understand what I'm saying? I feel like they're giving him all this stuff to make him like optimum fan favorite boy. Like the lightning scars, that's the kind of thing you give to your Tumblr OC to make them more special and unique looking. The sun is giving us some, like, chiaroscuro realness. So in that temporary break from the Nogitsune having power over him, Styles decides to check himself into the mental hospital. Make sure I never get out. I get it. I really do. This was probably the smart decision, but this just makes for an utterly ridiculous scenario and level of escalation. You thought this was just a campy show about a teenage werewolf? Wrong. It's now about a tortured boy possessed by a demon being forcefully sedated at the creepy mental hospital. I'm also sorry that I keep referring to it only as the creepy mental hospital, but you have to understand this isn't like a measured, grounded depiction of a mental health facility. This place is basically the institution from American Horror Story Asylum. It's called Eichen House, but everyone calls it Echo House, and this is why. It's this place, something about the way that it was built, everything echoes eventually. That's why they call it Echo House. Everything echoes in here, that's why they call it Echo House, has big Beacon Hills is actually a beacon energy. Okay, now the weird thing about Beacon Hills is that it actually is a beacon. As soon as Styles walks in, he witnesses someone taking their own life, and when this happened, I kind of assumed it was another one of his hallucinations, but it wasn't. And according to his roommate, who is the guy from True Jackson VP, this happens truly all the time. Is it Monday? There's a much higher rate of suicide on Mondays. They've got to get better funding for mental health services in Beacon Hills. Bad track record so far. Also, as he's settling into the creepy mental hospital, Styles finds out that Malia Tate is also a patient there. I forgot to mention this character entirely. At the beginning of season 3B, Sheriff Stalinsky, having recently learned of the existence of the supernatural, is reevaluating some of his old cases with this new knowledge in mind, and he gets suspicious about this case from a few years ago where a family was in a car crash and a little girl, Malia Tate, went missing. He starts to suspect that this may have had to do with werewolves and that maybe Malia is still alive. It turns out that Malia, now a teenager, is A, the long-lost biological daughter of Peter Hale, I don't know, and B, a were-coyote who has been completely shifted into a coyote and living in the woods for the last several years. I'm kind of obsessed with this storyline. I wasn't sure I would like Malia, I don't know, I think I hate change, so I am sometimes wary of new characters being introduced to the main cast, but this whole concept is so bonkers and funny that I'm kind of down. Malia, I like you. So far. So because she was fully living as a coyote for years, she's kind of feral now and has thus also checked herself into the creepy mental hospital. I do want to say, I don't think they made her feral enough. Like, no human contact for six or seven years. I think she should have been, like, fully nonverbal, biting people, whatever. I feel like that was kind of a missed opportunity. I love women who are, like, crazy. Anyway, earlier this season, it was Scott and Styles and friends who ended up turning Malia back into a human, and when she and Styles see each other again, she punches him in the face because I guess becoming human again has made her life more difficult. But she eventually decides to help him out because he says he can get someone to teach her how to change back. I might know somebody who could teach you how to change. I admit, I honestly thought he was talking about Derek here, because Derek is the only werewolf character that we've seen teach other werewolves how to control their powers, but apparently he was talking about Scott. 
because Scott is just that perfect, despite the fact that he can barely control his own shifting at the moment. Styles needs to get down into the basement for some reason, and Malia helps him, and they end up kissing, <laughs> okay? And I'm gonna quote the wiki again here. The pair apparently have sex. I'm starting to identify a lot with these wiki writers. This is exactly how it feels to watch the show. You're like, I think that just happened, but I couldn't really tell you. Despite never having watched this season back in the day, this is something I remember happening just because it was like so sensational. I remember seeing all sorts of reactions to this episode on Tumblr when it aired. And again, I kind of thought I would hate this and don't get me wrong, I, I didn't like it, <laughs> but kind of like the Malia thing, the whole concept was so incredibly absurd that I couldn't stay mad at it. I was watching this in my university's library, trying to hold in my tears from laughter because I realized I was watching two deranged teenagers lose their virginities to each other in the creepy, disgusting torture basement of the Beacon Hills Mental Hospital. Like, how can you not laugh? I also kind of liked the way they just didn't dwell on this at all. It happens and then the plot just keeps going. It's not really addressed for the rest of the season, which I appreciated. It means less cringeworthy stuff for me and it kind of feels more real in a way. We can stop talking about this now. So they find the shriveled up corpse of the Nogitsune's former host in the basement where they just had sex, romantic, and then they get attacked by the guy from True Jackson VP, who is now under the influence of the Nogitsune. He sedates Malia, restrains Styles, and threatens to drill holes in her head if Styles doesn't let the Nogitsune possess him. What a roller coaster of a day this has been for Styles. Let me in, Styles. Let me in. So Styles lets him in, and now he is bad boy, void Styles. But he is Nogitsune now. He is void. Yeah, for some reason people call Possessed Styles Void Styles. It's because they say the Nogitsune is like a void. I don't know. Do I sound like I understand what goes on on this show most of the time? I just had to give you some of the highlights from the creepy mental hospital episode. It's pretty iconic. Now, the funny thing to me about Styles' possession is that it actually doesn't last very long at all. Like, most of the drama they milk out of this is actually in the first half of 3B, with Styles losing sleep and starting to be targeted by the Nogitsune. Once it actually fully possesses him, they get him back within the space of, like, an episode and a half. They still have to figure out how to kill it after that, and it's like slowly leeching styles of his life force, so the stakes are still high. But personally, I think they could have wrung more out of this by keeping him possessed for the remainder of the season. Basically, he gets out of the mental hospital off screen and causes some trouble by possessing some of our characters with flies that make them go crazy and give in to their worst impulses or something. Isaac tries to kill the twins, the twins try to kill Isaac, Derek hilariously tries to burn Chris Argent alive as revenge for his family. When it was gone into your head, this isn't the way to deal with it. You burn my family, I burn yours. Crazy Derek was probably my favorite. I mean, you all know at this point that I'm a Derek stan, but also it's just very funny to see someone as non-emotive as Derek have to act all deranged. I think Tyler Hecklin is a perfectly fine actor, but I do think he's at his best when he's playing kind of restrained characters, either a nice, normal guy or a grouchy, stoic guy like Derek. I know that now he plays Superman on that CW show, which I think sounds like a great role for him because that's a very straightforward character, right? I'm not sure he's really built to play crazy Derek, but that's why I loved it. There's also something so funny about the way he sluices this lighter fluid onto Chris. This is how I look dressing a salad. This is how I look drenching everything I eat in Cholula. This is how I look sprinkling Degrassi references into all my videos. But it's okay, all of these characters are eventually de-flied. During all of this, the gang wrangles Void Styles back to Scott's house and hilariously just keep him sitting there paralyzed by Canima Venom for a few hours while they figure out what to do. He's taunting people and breaking them down psychologically, but he still looks like Dylan O'Brien, right? And he's just sitting there limply, unable to do anything. While writing this, I was trying to figure out who or what Possessed Styles was reminding me of. And 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think what I had in mind was the little killer voodoo doll from that Lifetime horror movie, Killer Under the Bed, that I reviewed a while back. I wish they'd had Styles do this. Anyway, they eventually realize that they might be able to separate Styles from the Nogitsune if they do this werewolf ritual. I think I mentioned this very briefly in passing while talking about 3A, but basically at one point Peter reveals that sometimes if an alpha werewolf puts their claws into someone's neck in just the right way, they can like go inside their mind. It's an ancient ritual used mostly by alphas since it's a skill that requires quite a bit of practice. This is page one of the bullshit Bible, obviously. Clearly something the writers came up with on the spot that is completely ridiculous. But they decide to give this a shot, because maybe if they can access Styles' mind, they can find him in there. Scott decides to take Lydia with him for some reason, maybe as like an emotional anchor, but yeah, Scott and Lydia get in there. Styles and the Nagitsune are just chilling on the Nemeton, playing the Japanese board game Go. So it can't be that bad to be possessed by the Nagitsune. Like, yeah, there's the psychological torment, but at least he'll just sit and play tabletop games with you to pass the time. Imagine if they were just playing like Settlers of Catan, Apples to Apples. And get this, Scott gets Styles' attention by howling because pack is life or something. So how do wolves signal their location to the rest of the pack? By the way, the howling on this show sounds nothing like howling. It just sounds like they're roaring or yelling. I can't help but wonder if they thought a real howl sound would just be a little too silly. <laughs> But it works. Again, this feels deceptively easy. I feel like they could have drawn this depossession out a little bit more. At least maybe have the characters do what they did for Scott in the Motel California episode, like have them give their emotional speeches about how much Styles means to them or something. That would feel a little more climactic. The separation process is pretty fun though. They have Styles vomit out all of these bandages and he vomits so many bandages that they make a whole new guy. <laughs> and at first you think it's the Nogitsune, but they unwrap the bandages and it's also Styles. So they do that thing where they're like, wait, if this is Styles, then who's that? Where are they? If this Styles just threw up a bunch of bandages and this Styles came out of the bandages, then who's flying the plane? So now there are two Styleses. If you haven't watched this show, you might be thinking that this will be the beginning of several dramatic scenarios with both Styleses where the other characters aren't sure which is which. That's certainly what I thought would happen, but there's none of that. It's disappointing. I was anticipating a lot more of that campy thing where you have two lookalikes and one of them's like, kill him, he's the double. And the other one's like, no, I'm the real one. I guess I like it when my media just operates like a comic book from the 1950s. But alas, the two Styleses just stay relatively separate for most of the remainder of the season. Evil boy Styles has escaped and the stronger he gets, the weaker the real Styles gets. So that's really the only drama they try to get out of this. There's this scene in one of the last episodes where the gang needs to get somewhere and Styles is driving. And it's like, I know he probably doesn't let anyone else drive his Jeep, but come on guys, you're gonna let him drive? The hallucinating guy who hasn't slept in three weeks? I just realized that another thing I have neglected to mention until this very moment is these guys, they're called the Oni, like Japanese demons, and they're actually presented as a somewhat neutral force for most of season 3B. They're just trying to find out who the Nogitsune is. So they'll come in acting all scary, but all they'll actually do is check you for Nogitsune-ism, and if you're clean, they'll mark you with this character that means self. So that's how they check that Styles is really himself, the Oni mark him, again, destroying any potential switcheroo drama we could have had. By the way, there's some wild backstory explaining some of this stuff that involves like the Yakuza and a guy named Silverfinger. I didn't absorb much of this subplot while watching, and I certainly didn't have the energy to try and pour over any more of the wiki pages than I had to while writing this, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. 
The Oni are being controlled by Noshiko, I think, and her knife tails, but after the Nogitsune escapes, he takes control of one of the tails or something, and thus gains control of the Oni and has them start attacking our characters. Now, Allison has figured out that the silver weapons that she and her dad make can kill the Oni somehow. So in this show, silver is not a weakness for werewolves, but apparently it is a weakness for Oni. Who's a different kind of bullet? What, silver bullet? No, you idiot. The bullet that you used to shoot the Oni, was that a silver bullet? Yes. Allison has figured this out and kills one of the Oni with her silver arrowhead, but then she is immediately stabbed and killed by another Oni. She's dead. She dies. This is the end of Allison. R.I.P. I don't feel quite as bad as when Boyd or Erica died because those were characters who really didn't get much time on the show to live out their potential. Allison has always had a lot of screen time and drama and whatnot, so I didn't mind too much. I've heard that the actress wanted to be written off the show to explore other opportunities and because she felt she was getting too old to want to play a teenage character. And that's very fair. Um, Crystal Reed was one of the older teen cast members. She's actually older than Tyler Hecklin, so although I said earlier that Derek needs to stop creeping around the high school or he'll get noticed, to be fair, by this show's logic, he could be high school aged. But Reed was already in her late 20s when this show started. I can imagine it feels a little weird to still be in teen stuff at that point. So I respect her decision. And that's that. Goodbye, Allison. We'll always have Scott's username and password. His username is Allison. His password is also Allison. The last episode of the season all leads up to the gang killing the Nogitsune, which is actually kind of lame once they finally do it. There was this whole thing a few episodes ago where we learned that the Nogitsune can't occupy a body that transforms. So there was this question of should they bite Styles, but nothing came of that. So now, in the climax of the big showdown, Scott bites Void Styles and Kira runs him through with her magical sword. I would explain what makes the sword magical, but I don't remember. A fly comes out of the Nagitsune's mouth, they trap it in a box made of the wood of the Nemeton, and then the guy gets all crusty and dusty and dies. R.I.P. Nagitsune. You came, you saw, you served cunt. Concurrently to this, Derek and the twins have been fending off the Oni, and Chris Argent and Isaac, who have figured out what Allison figured out about the silver arrows, come through with the arrows and the group manages to defeat the Oni, but not before Aiden, the straight twin, also dies by the sword. R.I.P. Aiden. You lived, you died, your only distinguishing characteristic was being straight. And regular Styles is okay again. He survived the ordeal. So in the aftermath, Chris and Isaac leave town together, possibly indefinitely. I don't think they're in the next season. This is nice. You know, Isaac was in need of a dad and well, sadly, Chris is now in need of a kid. We see that Malia is going to start going to school. So I guess she's joining the Scooby gang. Ethan, gay twin, says his goodbyes to his love interest, Danny, and Danny reveals that he actually knew about werewolves this whole time. Wow. I just don't think I can do it. Date me. Date a werewolf. But I'm pretty sure after this season, Danny disappears from the show and it's never explained. So goodbye, Danny. We see that Scott is trying to move on from Allison's death. I assume that will be his thing for a while. And finally, we get this scene of Derek in the high school locker room. <laughs> Come on, Derek. Uh, recounting a dream to Styles of all people. He says he dreamt that hunters were attacking him in his loft, asking him for information about La Loba. Now, my friend, you gonna tell us about La Loba? Oh yeah, another thing I forgot to mention is that there has been a very sparse subplot in 3B where these Mexican hunters keep coming to Derek and Peter, they actually had them held captive at the beginning of the season, asking them about La Loba, and Peter and Derek keep having to be like, we don't know what that is. We don't know what a La Loba is. We really don't know what you're talking about. And Derek implies that he wonders if Kate Argent in season one, when Peter slashed her throat, could have turned into a werewolf instead of dying. Because in some cases, a deep enough scratch from an alpha can turn people. Can you get turned by scratch? If the claws go deep enough. 
And Derek's like, I'm actually not even sure if I'm awake now because I don't remember waking up. So Styles tries to do the finger thing and he has six fingers. Ooh. So Derek wakes up and who should be in front of him shooting at him but Kate Argent. Kate's back, baby. Everyone's favorite statutory rapist. Apparently she is La Loba. She appears to be some sort of werewolf now, so that's fun. Before we move on, let me address a couple other things I forgot to mention previously. God, I forgot all about Scott's dad. Fuck, I really don't want to talk about Scott's dad, but somebody's got to do it. So as I touched on earlier, Scott's dad, Agent McCall, came back to town at the end of season 3A. I'll try not to say too much, partly because I don't want to, but also because he doesn't figure into the plot much. It's mainly just an emotional subplot, pretty divorced from all of the supernatural stuff. And normally I would be like, yes, give me emotional subplots divorced from the supernatural stuff. I love character development but I dislike Scott and I dislike McCall even more, so it's just torture when they're on screen together. Like I said before, McCall is an FBI agent, so he comes to town to investigate the druid serial killings and he spends most of his time in season three just being an absolute ass and making life really difficult for Styles' dad. And like, everybody loves Styles' dad, so they kind of set up this character for failure by making his main thing at first that he's trying to get the sheriff fired. Eventually, he actually helps him keep his job, but at that point he's already done so much damage and been such an asshole the whole time that it doesn't do much to endear him to the viewer. And then they just keep digging him into a deeper and deeper hole. We get a few hints throughout the season from Styles that he knows why Scott's dad left and Melissa has been hiding the truth from Scott. And finally, McCall tells him the truth about what happened. And here is the truth. Scott's dad used to be an alcoholic, and one time when Scott was little, McCall was drunkenly arguing with Melissa and accidentally knocked Scott down the stairs. Scott was unconscious for like 20 seconds, and when he woke up, had no memory of what happened. So Scott's dad decided to never drink again and left the family. Your mom told me to be out by the morning. <laughs> I don't know if they thought that this would make us like Agent McCall more? Like we, as the viewer, what is our reaction to this supposed to be? Are we supposed to say, no, baby boy, Scott's dad, that obviously wasn't your fault. You didn't intentionally throw your child down the stairs. We watched you tumble down those stairs. Because Scott's response is to be angry with him, not because he did this, but because he decided to leave. He seems to think that this incident wasn't that big of a deal. It's really bizarre. See you at graduation. Or whenever you decide to show up again. So then in the last episode, there's this dumb thing where Melissa is injured by one of the Oni at the hospital, and she and McCall are trapped together for a while and work out their issues, and McCall basically decides he's gonna try to be a part of Scott's life. I would just stay gone. I think you've done enough. This was just so weird. I really thought there was gonna be a reveal where like Melissa had an affair or something. I don't know. I guess I thought that because McCall had thus far been depicted as so horrible and unlikable that the show was gonna pull out some big redeeming fix it that proved he had a good reason to leave or something. I did not expect them to just add another extremely unlikable, alarming detail onto his already detestable character. It's like I said about season two, it's not really Tyler Posey's fault that Scott is such a bad character. It seems like the writers just have no idea what direction to take him in. They have really clear emotional conflicts for everyone but Scott. I did say in my review of season two that I would like the show to explore Scott's relationship with his mom more, but instead of doing that, they brought in this terrible dad character. How do you fuck up this bad? Okay, that's it. I've had about enough of this guy. But on a very, very different note, I want to talk about another character I've managed not to bring up yet. Someone I would say is actually one of the best parts of the show. Coach. What about me? Try not to take any in the face. I realized recently that at the beginning of all of this, I listed our main teen characters, I listed our parent characters, I listed our weird other category characters like Derek and Deaton, but I have not yet mentioned Coach Bobby Finstock. 
a crime, honestly. Let's go on a little Finstock tangent and give him his time to shine. Coach Finstock coaches the boys lacrosse team. In season three, he also coaches cross country and he's also the school's economics teacher. Finstock's main traits are that he's aggressive and overbearing and weird for comedic effect. Stolinski, stop reminding me why I drink. He gets a lot of goofy one-liners and whatnot. I really loved this scene at the end of season one. As I mentioned many hours ago, Scott isn't allowed to go to the school dance because he's failing all of his classes, but of course he sneaks in anyway and he's trying to evade Coach. But Coach eventually does catch him and starts yelling at him. He's about to kick him out. And in actually one of my favorite Scott moments, one of the only things he's ever done that I found kind of smart and funny, he grabs Danny and pretends to be at the dance with Danny. McCall! You're not supposed to! A crowd has formed and suddenly it looks to everyone like Coach Finstock is just being homophobic. I, I was just saying he was not supposed to, I mean, I wasn't saying that he sh shouldn't, you guys don't think. And he kind of has to let Scott stay for fear of being canceled. It's not the cleverest thing in the world, but for some reason for 2011 Teen Wolf, I found this kind of nuanced and hilarious. It's a non-homophobic gay joke, which, you know, the bar being on the floor actually takes some complexity. Then there's this scene in season two where it's revealed that before every championship lacrosse game, Coach gives the same speech, and it is always the speech from Independence Day. In less than an hour, aircraft from here will be joining others from around the world. Is this? Yeah, it's a speech from Independence Day. I like this guy, he's fun. And then on a more serious level, there's this thing at the end of season three where this mysterious girl named Meredith shows up at the school. I didn't mention it because it's not that important. Basically, she's a banshee and an escaped mental patient and the gang were briefly trying to use her to track Lydia and the Nagitsune. I have a feeling this was mostly just to set up the character for use in later seasons, but we'll see if I'm right. But because of this, some employees from the creepy mental hospital show up at the school to take her back. And when one of them interacts with Coach, it becomes clear that this guy was like, Coach's high school bully? What is that saying? Those who can't do, teach? Yeah. You see him shrink back and suddenly you feel this overwhelming sympathy for Coach. Like, my God, what's the backstory here? And basically when the gang pleads with Coach to not let the orderlies take Meredith because they need her help, Coach decides to trust them and tases the guy. This school has a very strict no bullying policy. Good on ya, Coach. But probably my favorite non-diegetic detail about Coach Finstock is that the actor said more recently in an interview that after a certain point in like season two, he just stopped reading the full episode scripts. Like he would just read his own scenes. I have a confession. I don't think I read a script after season two. <laughs> <laughs> it's the script. Which, when I first heard that, I was on season two, and I didn't think much of it then, because in the first two seasons, coach scenes never really overlap with the supernatural stuff. It might be happening around him without his knowledge, but it's never really involved in his scenes. But then you have season three, wherein, oh, coach is chaperoning the field trip to the suicide motel. Like, can you imagine being that actor and having no context for any of that? Then in season 3B, there are these scenes like Styles' dream sequence where everyone, including Coach, is speaking sign language to him. What do you think he thought was going on here? Not to mention the episode in which Styles, under the influence of the Nogitsune, has Coach shot in the chest with an arrow. Or the aforementioned episode in which he has to deal with this mysterious escaped mental patient. I think this was king behavior. It sounds so funny. I love Coach. I look forward to three more seasons of Coach. Other stuff. Uh, when Styles is starting to be influenced by the Nagitsune, at first they want to rule out like physiological brain stuff, so they give him an MRI. And naturally, Styles is really afraid to get this test and see the results, so before he goes in, Scott tries to reassure him and they hug. It's supposed to be touching, but this show does so little to show us that Scott and Styles mean anything to each other that it doesn't feel particularly earned. The Scott and Styles friendship is the ultimate told and not shown relationship. 
we are told that they're best friends, but you almost never see them genuinely hanging out or enjoying each other's company. They're around each other a lot, but it's really only ever when they're doing plot stuff. I think their friendship would be more believable and it would probably help Scott be more likable if we just saw these two chilling every once in a while. You know, show them playing video games or going to the movies together. I think in season one, Scott inexplicably has an electric guitar in his bedroom. Maybe they could have been in a band together. That's such a fun teen show thing. And we know that Tyler Posey plays guitar and Dylan O'Brien plays the drums. It actually would have been kind of perfect. And you can write it into the show in silly ways, like, oh no, Styles, I'm wolfing out during our first big show. That's what I want out of my teen wolf. Anyway, in this MRI scene when they hug, I really wanted to take it seriously, but the way they blocked it, with Styles sitting up here and Scott standing, they clearly had no choice but to have Scott standing right in between Styles' open legs. I know it's childish, but I was laughing. In my notes from when I watched it, I just have written down, Scott and Styles hug, but Styles has legs sluttily apart. Oh my god, this thing happens at the end of 3A when Peter delivers the final blow to kill Jennifer, and then he looks up to the sky and yells, I've always been here Now obviously, this line is great just in its delivery. I fucking love Peter. Big mountain ash energy. Mountain ash! But also, this never goes anywhere, I'm pretty sure. They have him do this whole thing, kind of hint at a renewed villain arc, and it's just nothing. Never mentioned again. That's my boy. I really realized in this season how much I love Peter. He's such a refreshing presence on screen, especially in a more dark, moody season like this. I was so certain that this actor must be a theater guy, because he just oozes theater actor vibes, but it doesn't look like he is. He's so over the top and dramatic and hammy in a great way, like in a way that you can tell he's really talented. Some of his lines just make me laugh out loud. And because deception has a particularly accurate sense, Styles. There's this line in 3B where he mentions singing. He loves the sound of his own voice. You should hear me sing. I would like to see it. Let Peter sing, he just wants to sing. I love that he's supposed to be this morally ambiguous guy, but post season one, he seems overwhelmingly harmless. He would be not the villain in an animated movie, but like the silly little sidekick to the villain. He would be that bat from Anastasia. But yeah, supposedly he has always been the alpha, but that appears to have no consequences for the plot. Oh god, one more thing. There is a scene towards the end of 3A when Styles has a panic attack at school, and Scott isn't there for some reason. The only person there with him is Lydia, and she's not sure what to do, so she kisses him. There's a ghost upon the moor tonight. She gives this bullshit Bible explanation where she's like, I've heard that you can stop a panic attack by holding your breath, and somehow she knew that kissing him would make him not breathe instead of, you know, making him more overwhelmed. I know this is a dumb fictional show about werewolves, but for the love of God, please don't do this. Most people, when they're having a panic attack, probably the last thing they would want is for someone to start making out with them. I have to say though, and this is kind of a deep cut, but I hope some of you will understand. I got really into the musical The Phantom of the Opera last year, and my drug of choice is the 25th anniversary performance at the Royal Albert Hall. I probably watched that recording about 12 times just in like April 2022 alone. And I have to say, this shot of Lydia passionately kissing Styles while he looks on in shocked terror is extremely similar to the shot of Christine kissing the Phantom in specifically the 25th anniversary performance. They're the same picture. Uh, on that note, I think I should call it a day. There we are, season three done, and it only took me almost three times the amount of words I'm supposed to be writing for my thesis paper. 
All in all, despite this season, to my knowledge, being one of the more acclaimed in the series and something of a fan favorite, I found myself frequently getting frustrated with it. Season 3A was full of bizarre, incongruous elements that made the story muddled and near impossible to follow, and then 3B, despite having slightly more focus, had such a dour tone much of the time that it felt like a significant departure from the lighter, campier tone of the previous two seasons that I really loved. It makes total sense that they wanted to give a more serious storyline to Dylan O'Brien, but at the same time, in the larger scope of the show, the thing about making your main comic relief character, like, super edgy and dark, is that the show suddenly loses a lot of the lighter stuff. And don't get me wrong, I fully understand why people liked that. I imagine that a lot of fans probably love this season for the very reasons I didn't like it as much. I'm sure a lot of people really enjoyed that dark tone and bad boy styles and whatnot. It's just a matter of taste but I won't give the same defense of 3A. I don't think there's any excuse for whatever that was. I don't plan to ever rewatch 3A. It was an absolute chore. If it's anyone's favorite part of the show, I would love to hear from you. I would love to study your mind. Wow, that sure was a lot of Teen Wolf. Is this the most I've ever written on one subject? Possibly. And this is only the beginning. So far, despite all of my teasing, I think this show is pretty decent. It's kind of an outlier among other Supernatural teen shows. The vibes are very unique. It's very watchable, there's some good humor. I personally think seasons one and two are a little more fun, but if you're into the darker stuff and you love watching Dylan O'Brien cry, you'll probably love season three. If you like videos like this, please do subscribe to the channel. Despite how silly of a topic I'm covering, I put a lot of labor into this. And as Brayden says in season three, episode 14, the girls gotta eat. I just realized I never even told you who Brayden is. Whatever. Don't hesitate to tell me about your Teen Wolf experience in the comments, or if you've never seen the show, what your impression of it is now. I'm always curious to hear that stuff. Stay tuned for the next video in this series, an intermission of sorts in which we turn back time to the origins of the Teen Wolf franchise. Until next time, I'm your Alpha. This has been Teen Wolf Video Part 1. I'll see you in 1985. An explanation is probably long overdue.